very good evening doctors warm welcome to the third and the last session of best of napcon 21 it's been an amazing success and we are sure that this program has achieved its objective of bringing the best of learning from napcon varanasi to your doorstep we thank all of you for being part of this first edition of best of napcon 21 you all have been a great audience and you have set a new benchmark for any such virtual scientific events. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the ICS leadership, specifically to Dr. Rajesh Surnakar, Dr. Rajadhar and Dr. J.K. Samaria for their complete support for this program. The contribution of scientific chair Dr. Rajesh V and Dr. Nitin Abhankar is also been immense and we are really thankful to both of them. At this moment, I would also want to express our sincere thanks to all the faculty who has been part of this first of its kind, best of NAPCON 21. We in mankind are really excited about our journey in respiratory. We are committed to work on 360 degree for protecting the lung health for everyone. In this journey, we intend to play a pivot role in educate and create more awareness about the importance of good lung health. We'll be working relentlessly to expand the early diagnosis and to elaborate the scope of lung health care. We believe it's going to be a collaborative effort between you and Aspiris Mankind because we share the common value of upholding good lung health care in India. We seek all your valuable feedback and guidance in this journey. So with this note, let me have the privilege of calling up Dr. Utsav Samaria, Organizing Secretary of NAPCON Varanasi to commence today's program and to also to introduce today's moderator to all of you. Wishing you a great viewing. All the best. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Utsav Samaria. Napcon Varanasi was a triumphant success and was enriched with abundance of scientific discussions and engaging workshops. Napcon Varanasi not only did the highest ever conference registrations, but also had maximum ever faculties participating. With seven parallel halls running round the clock, a scientific bonanza of unheard of proportions happened in Varanasi. It was followed by equally energizing cultural nights which includes the first ever Palmos Got Talent event. The evenings were indeed a success too. The culinary delights served throughout the event were highly appreciated by one and all. As NAPCON was happening two years after any big respiratory event, we had an energized crowd who had come to city of Mahadev Bhagwan Shankar not just to attend the event, but also to seek blessings from the newly built Kashi Vishnath Mandir. Indeed, Mahadev had truly blessed the event. Building upon the success of NAPCON, the best of NAPCON is an initiative for those who could not make out to the city of Varanasi because of some circumstances. I am sure you all have attended the previous two sessions of best of NAPCON. Commencing with the final day of, one of, of this one of its kind event, it gives me a great pleasure to share that best of NAPCON has been a resounding success until now. I am assured that the same excitement will be reflected in today's concluding day of this penultimate one of its kind event. We thank Mankind Esperis Division to be a part of this great initiative and bring it to your mobiles and laptops. Now, I welcome the scientific chair of Best of NAPCON, Dr. Rajesh V, the moderator of today's sessions, to take the session ahead. Thank you so much from Varanasi NAPCON office. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar also for setting the tone for the day three of the Best of NAPCON 2021. At the outset, I congratulate the ICS leadership, Dr. Swarnakar, Dr. Ajadar, and others, as well as NAPCON 2021 organizing team, Dr. Samaria, Dr. Kumar also, etc., for coming up with the idea of this brilliant event. And I sincerely thank Mankind Aspiris team for providing support and executing this to perfection. I would also like to place upon record my sincere gratitude for allowing me and Dr. Nitin to be the scientific chairpersons, as well as me to be the moderator for today. We have actually come to the last of the three scintillating days of uh, Best of NAPCON 2021. And as we have repeatedly stressed, 
a post conference event of this fashion is happening for the very first time in the history of napcon and so i would say that history is being created and history is being created in an exemplary fashion the previous two days have been a runaway successes or if i can use the so called bollywood language bumper hits in whatever sense we may consider them whether it be the popularity whether it be the sheer number of attendees the repute and class of uh, faculty or the quality and scientific content of discussions what we have aimed and attempted is to bring together an abbreviated and uh, a sort of filtered version of the takeaway run messages of the napcon 2021 and this has been designed as uh, real world case scenarios case based panel discussions which stress on day to day challenges in bedside patient management as well as patient advances so the third day that is today will witness three panels one dedicated to each on interventional pulmonology pulmonary vascular diseases and asthma and we have three global stalwarts anchoring each of these three sessions to be very precise dr pataviraman dr nitin abhyankar and dr deepak talwar and we have three panelists of national repute joining all this in starting some of the experts now the privilege is upon me to introduce the team for the first panel discussion of the day which perhaps is the most exciting and eventful sub specialty in pulmonary medicine namely interventional pulmonology we have the most apt person to be the facilitator for this team in dr pataviraman i don't think he need any he needs any formal introduction to any pulmonology forum anywhere in the country but to be precise he is the director of pulmonary medicine at the royal care hospital coimbatore along with his uh, two equally formidable colleagues dr mahadevan and rajesh sinwasan who actually are the trimurtis comprising the pulmonary associates of royal care hospital he is an interventional pulmonologist whom all of us look forward to uh, to guiding us and mentoring us uh, in various aspects of interventional pulmonology and he is credited with installation of many equipments in interventional pulmonology for the first time in the country like ebus way back in 20, 2009 bronchial thermoplasty services etc etc a clinician an academician and an orator par excellence he is also very passionate in the sub specialty of sleep medicine at a personal level he always has been one of my idols of worship and a role model right from the time i graduated in pulmonary medicine and again sir over to you for guiding us through the panel discussion in interventional pulmonology okay hi good evening um uh, first of thanks rajesh for this nice introduction and uh, i i'm quite delighted to be uh, you know moderating a, a what would uh, be a promising uh, what is promising to be a fascinating session on interventional pulmonology uh, i thank mankind pharma for uh, actually putting it out together and getting the best of napcon Uh, and uh, i've got with me uh, three other uh, you know eminent national uh, nationally renowned uh, people who actually are going to be along with us uh, i mean uh, uh, i mean we're going to uh, talk about a uh, uh, few issues in interventional pulmonology that would be of some significance and uh, we've chosen these topics specifically from the uh, from what happened in the napcon and uh, we're just concentrating on uh, a part of uh, you know diagnostic and a part of uh, therapeutic the diagnostic part will be about peripheral lesions and therapeutic part will be about specifically about uh, you know bronchial asthma and copd interventions and we'll just get into some uh, interesting questions based out of these talks or the others also so with me we have uh, wonderful people here I, I, all of them are good friends uh, i think uh, they need no introduction uh, the, the first one is dr nagarjun nagarjun mathuru is a consultant pulmonologist he heads uh, the hyderabad eshoda and he's a uh, i mean he's got various publications and uh, he's a regular speaker both in national and inter international uh, conferences and he's uh, uh, the pioneer in uh, many things uh, uh, one of which is uh, you know getting a intervapor he's pioneered this uh, interventional uh, uh, thing and uh, i think he's a regular fixture at this point in most of the interventional conferences and then we have renis davis renis davis renis davis is from trichur amla institute of medical sciences he is a dm uh, uh, professor he he trains dm uh, post graduates and he's a his special interest is in the interventional pulmonology and we have uh, the young and dynamic atri gangopadhyaya whose passion is teaching atri is from ranchi a very good friend and he's uh, i mean his uh, uh, usp is uh, he's a first uh, 
to uh, get airway uh, oscillometry and his uh, uh, you know area of interest in uh, uh, airway diseases but also he specializes in uh, uh, icu bronchoscopies and i think he'll uh, will pick his brains about uh, you know discussing about that so uh, the flow of events will be like this i'll give a, a small case presentation i will have a few questions uh, based on that and subsequently dr nagarjun will be talking about uh, asthma and copd in interventions for about 10 to 12 minutes and then we'll have some more uh, some more questions related to that and probably uh, something else and then we'll uh, break for question and answers so now let me share the, the screen i'll not waste uh, uh, more time in this hope you are able to see my uh, um yes, yes we, can, we can see okay so uh, it's about peripheral lesion what is a peripheral lesion any lesion that abuts the chest wall needs only an ultrasound or uh, i mean it doesn't need any ct or bronchoscopic technique so the lesions like this is not what we're going to talk about we are going to talk about a lesion or a nodule which is surrounded by the lung it's uh, typically in the mid and lateral third something similar to that now there if you have to do uh, you know go through both ways you'll have to pass through some normal areas so let's look at it based on the case presentation a middle aged gentleman posted for spinal surgery who is a smoker and a diabetic so you have both malignancy and tuberculosis as an option routine pre op evaluation had a nodule in x ray ct was done it shows a spn in the left uh, you know superior basal segment referred for diagnosis this is how it it looked now there are different ways of approaching this lesion this is a less than 2 cm lesion here you could uh, you know land a needle directly from the ct guidance or you could do bronchoscopic thing with the advent of ct and the screening for lung cancer has been i mean a lot more of uh, ppls have been noted especially after covid a huge number of people have been uh, subjected to the ct and we've seen a lot of incidental nodules they're bronchoscopically invisible and they pose a diagnostic challenge conventional bronchoscopy these are blind areas because after th three or four segments you would not really three or four generation you not see them and ct guided ttna has high yield for these but significant rate of pneumothorax and you can see that ct guided fna yields high sensitivity around 90% but if the size is less than 1.5 cm the sensitivity drops down and if you have to traverse a lot of length i mean you can see that if you have to traverse somewhere in the middle the sensitivity drops further and there is also a difference between a core biopsy and an fna Now, if you do an FNA, the pneumothorax might be less, but if you do a core biopsy, the pneumothorax size. It's not only that; there is a pulmonary hemorrhage, which also increases when you do a core biopsy. And these days, the oncologists are quite demanding. You can't really stop the FNA, see, and that's the reason why a CT guided biopsy may have certain flip sides. Let's look at bronx sampling and what are the things that we need if we have to go through the peripheral lesion. So. He'll he'll need to have some technology to go close to the lesion. It could be a thinner bronchoscope wherein you can just go further few generations. But you might also need a navigation or a robotics apart from a strong bronchoscopic, uh, you know, uh, uh, perspective. Not only about reaching, uh, you know, closer to the lesion, you'll also have to confirm that you are somewhere there because you can't see anything through the bronchoscope. So you might need a radial probe. alternatively you can have cone beam ct if you have a rich uh, uh, you know uh, uh, boss and you might need a fluoroscopy but fluoroscopy being a two plane may not be uh, you know as good and there are few things like uh, optical coherence tomography or confocal microscopy that might be of interest but it's it's very few and far in between you will also need biopsy tools you need in fact variety of tools because just not enough to do a biopsy because it depends on the pattern of relation with the lesion and when i say pattern of relation to the lesion here these are the pictorial representations you could see that this is a type 1 lesion where the bronchus goes and ends in the tumor this is easiest and you can see this is the airway that leads on to the lesion and if you put in a radial probe you will see a lesion all around however if you have a uh type 2 lesion where it goes through type 4 is where there is a block in uh, before it goes in and type 3 which is actually more common it's quite common also where the lesion goes all around now here if you put in a biopsy you might not really take a biopsy sample because it might not even reach there you'll need a different kind of tool so uh when you have this kind of a type 3 lesion where you know, if you look at the radial probe you have all eccentric things so the lesion is on one side of the airway then it's not enough to have just a uh, biopsy or a brushing so type 1 biopsy or brushing is good if you have a type 2 lesion 
you might need forceps brushing and the biopsy i mean as they were saying in a type 3 lesion that needs to be something that goes beyond the airway which means it's either a needle or a cryo so uh, you you'll need a uh, you know uh, appropriate tools for an appropriate lesion let's just uh, look briefly at a radial probe uh, you know uh, i'm not going to detail of all these uh, thing but what is important is to realize that you have a small miniature uh, endobronchial ultrasound probes which goes into the instrument channel and it gives you a 360 degrees uh, you know account of what is around it when you push in a radial probe through a guide sheath you actually know where you are and once you take this radial probe and put in all the instruments that i was just saying it can be a biopsy forceps or a uh, you know brushing or uh, a tb and a needle so what are the things that you look for if you do a radial probe the size of the lesion if it's more than 3 cm you have a very good chance of making a diagnosis the probe position as i already alluded to if it's in the center you'll have a good chance of making a diagnosis if it's in the eccentric thing you know that the airway is around the lesion so you might not be able to get it and there is a bronchus sign that is always very important it has a very good uh, you know a chance of making a diagnosis what is the yield of radial probe so when you when you compare yourself with the 30% 90% that radiologist will tell you you can see that if you use all these your yield is somewhere between 50 and 80% okay so um, let's move on to the uh, navigation tool so uh, after uh, uh, radial probe beavers we have uh, uh you know a technology to ensure that we reach the place where we have to sample a lung point is what is available in india and uh, you know it's a software actually basically which can load your ct and then it can give you uh, you know it can plan your uh, thing and give you three possible path through which you can actually uh, reach this place so imagine this is a place a patient's uh, thing we'll come back to that and this is the lesion which is in the left superior basal region so we use this and you have two uh, screens on uh, each side one will be the virtual bronchoscopy and which will give you a, a blue line in which all you need is just to follow that blue line and you can actually reach the place which is uh, which was being uh, marked earlier so uh, it's it's like a, a like playing a video game and here you can see once you reach that place so here you you're going into the left lower lobe and this is the left sixth segment and once you go into the follow the blue line and you reach there and it's not enough if you reach there because you're not seeing anything so the machine shows or the uh, software is say that i mean you've reached some point but you'll have to be sure where you are so you can't just put in your biopsy straight away so a, a radial probe beavers is actually mandatory and here you can see it's it's a type 3 lesion here it's a type 3 lesion and hence what do we do we actually put in a cryo probe and then you if we make a diagnosis and this actually turned out to be a a granuloma and ab was also positive so uh, you know what do you require for a sampling you need a, need a bronchoscope you need accessories you need a radial probe fluoro is optional with adding a virtual a bronchoscope or nav navigation along with your uh, uh, radial probe beavers you actually improve the lesion uh, i mean you improve your yield when the lesion size is less than 2 uh, cm so uh, in smaller lesions adding a navigation obviously make a, a better sense so you can actually have a forceps reaching the lesion but there is always a problem of lesion reaching the forceps you can see that the success of navigation and reaching there is very high but it doesn't translate into a meaningful yield and that is where we always have a problem because this is where we are compared with the radiologist and that is because the bulk of the type 3 lesions you can actually reach there you can even scrape it you can do a biopsy but you will not get a yield and that is where ct guided uh, biopsy will score over and that is where you need to use lot more of a cryo biopsy and this patient needed a cryo biopsy we, we actually had an inflammatory thing with the afb growing there so to end these are the key points peripheral pulmonary lesions and spn or diagnostic challenge radiologists are the gold standard radial probe with or without fluoroscopy achieve suboptimal lesions i and obviously a navigation will help improving the diagnostic yield the constraints are obviously initial capital cost and i think uh, uh, thanks for your attention and we'll i'll stop here and we will take a, a couple of uh, uh, questions and we'll actually pick the brains of our eminent uh, panel here so i'm going off uh, taking the slides off and i'll uh, Uh, let's just discuss some aspects of these uh, uh, you know uh, approach to peripheral lesions 
so uh, i mean i'll start with nagarjun nagarjun what do you think about uh, i mean are there other uh, uh, things that you can do to yield, uh, improve the yield in peripheral lesions i just want your perspective on that Professor, as usual, the talk was excellent, uh, crystal clear for for all of those who who want to practice uh, bronchoscopy for peripheral pulmonary lesions. As far as improving the yield is concerned, I think uh, choosing the correct case is what is more important. As you rightly said, case with a positive bronchus sign has the best yield. The size of the nodule again has a significant impact. More than two centimeters, very good yield. Less than two, the yield comes down. Then in our experience, what we have seen is addition of cryo is making a huge impact. So whenever we see an eccentric like the one you have shown, we have we are routinely doing cryobiopsis. Third is addition of rapid onset evaluation, just like linear rebus. Nowadays, even for radio rebus, we are using rapid onset evaluation, and that is actually helping a bit to optimize our biopsy techniques and also to an extent improving the yield. In addition to this, the other fancy tools which which are likely to come in. are the cone beam ct which is sort of a three dimensional fluoro uh, wherein uh, you can actually have a real time visualization of the forceps which is the problem with radial lebus in radial lebus you see the nodule but you don't see when you're sampling the nodule so that is where the fluoro or the cone beam ct will actually come and help then the other things which are there outside india which we don't have are the robotics so robotic is something again uh, uh, which will guide you to the lesion much more accurately and precisely then the archimedes or the btpna wherein if you don't have a path head on path also you can create a tunnel so that is likely to be introduced in our country again so you have it, it's a very exciting uh, uh, field you in addition to what we have you also can have in the future cbct you can have archimedes you can have robotics so the the whole the the scope of peripheral pulmonary lesion and bronchoscopy is very exciting in the future lovely so uh, atri uh, uh, can i ask you and we'll be will be quite eager to see what where uh, your place is taking our uh, you know uh, country in terms of approaching peripheral lesions and atri uh, i would like to uh, get your uh, opinion on uh, you know as uh, when you evaluating these uh, peripheral lesions do you do you actually think about a pet ct and if you want to do a pet ct will you do it before or after can you just throw some light on uh, role of pet ct and when does it fit in thank you patavi sir excellent presentation thank you mankind for the kind opportunity and hosting this program the beautiful thing about intervention bronchoscopy in peripheral lesion with or without pet ct is something which was not treatable is becoming increasingly more treatable lung cancer diagnosis used to be very nihilistic because statistics say that most of the lung cancer are diagnosed late we cannot do anything but as we are getting these technologies we are picking up early and the biggest problem with picking up early lies in the number of false positive like in near covid or after covid lot of people got this walk in ct scans and where we could see this suspicious something sub centimetric it would be 9 mm it would be 1.5 cm but we don't know where, but it used to be solid so 1.5 solid you have to go for a tissue sampling and often it used to come out something like a hematoma or it used, used to come out like something like a old scar even in people who had a smoking history or even in people who had a history so there comes the role of a 18 fdg pet ct or sometimes they even use thymidine contrast or iodinated contrast now pet ct if it is a solid lesion on ct scan is a wonderful option with respect to the increase suv uptake if there is a increase suv uptake there is more chance of a biopsy coming positive if there is a cold lesion only in certain cases of neuroendocrine there can be a false negative for the pet ct yeah ground glass means not solid lesion pet ct can show a cold uptake because sometimes ground glass lesions can land up to be a ca in situ earlier which used to be called that bronchiolo alveolar carcinoma this is about pet ct prior to sampling to prevent these number of false negatives like scars etc now let's come to pet ct after the procedure the procedure has been done sometimes everything said and done, done despite the best things we have at our time the cytology may come inconclusive those are the time where we can consider a pet ct or the procedure has been done and definitely it is malignancy 
then pet city to more to look for the anything distant or what what does the mediastinum look like like do we need to give some downgrading radiation for the mediastinum before proceeding let's say for a resection surgery so the best thing about various modalities is even one decade ago these things were not available now i work at ranchi which would consider a tier 3 city even we have a pet city so there is no excuse for me not reaching out to this peripheral lesions when i have a pet city in my town okay so lovely so you actually clearly told us what are the importance of uh, you know having a pet ct what are the pitfalls and what are the things that you look for uh, even if it's negative it doesn't rule out malignancy and so on so uh, i think yeah it's it's a useful technology but it cannot replace a biopsy so uh, obviously you'll have to do a pet but, but again go ahead and uh, make a diagnosis based on uh, what you see on a pet so ren is uh, uh, you uh, i mean if you want to add to that you can add uh, but after that you can also Uh, share with us as to what is the role of dual thing so you have a radial probe obviously have to come uh, along with the convex probe we've seen uh, uh, time to time that there might be nodes which are not very clearly seen on the ct but if you have a node uh, it's it's quite useful to you know sample that so that you can actually uh, you know do both the diagnosis and staging so what are your thoughts on that and most importantly how do you uh, uh, you know think about anesthesia for all these uh, you know uh, critical peripheral pulmonary work uh, renis yeah well what i can add your uh, talk was excellent what can I, i can add for uh, radial probe in indian scenario is uh, uh, if you use a guide sheet and uh, take out the probe once you reach the lesion uh, you can do all kind of uh, wash uh, brush uh, biopsy transbungal needle aspiration as well as cryo if you have the luxury of uh, 1.1 or 1.9 cryo you can even sample the ground glassing as well as the uh, non solid lesions or uh, any nodule over there so um, i think you can uh, use all the weapons of uh, your armamentarium for uh, getting a good diagnostic work up and you can send all this wash brush biopsy needle aspiration and cryo for uh, the histopathological examination as well as for uh, whatever you are uh, talking about the cbnat or uh, some uh, uh, higher molecular studies um The, the actually uh, dr pradabi basically the, the the there were new uh, recent papers like uh, actually the size and the location doesn't matter for uh, this uh, diagnostic yield it's all about the uh, operator's uh, experience and uh, also uh, the bronchus sign you were mentioning about um, uh, and also if you use maximum tools for getting the diagnosis including the tbna as you have told for the few kind of lesions type three and all so that uh, uh, you can use all the tools and get the try to get the maximum diagnosis uh, that's about uh, the uh, the radial probe uh, uh, the all you need to park the uh, guide sheet over there when you uh, get the lesion and then go for the all the investigative uh, procedures um second part you are asking about the anesthesia what i what i feel is you can um, they they go well with the uh, conscious sedation uh, uh, usually uh, what i feel is uh, we can go with uh, some uh, fentanyl and uh, midazolam and then uh, uh, usually it's, it it takes um, uh, slightly about more time for uh, uh, reaching a ready, uh, the distant lesion if you have a cm guidance uh, it's very uh, along with uh, um, the probe uh, radial probe i think you can reach uh, faster uh, and what the literature says recently if uh, the trans uh, uh, thoracic needle aspiration you combine ettna and um, your uh, uh, radial probe ebers uh, uh, as well as uh, the virtual bronchoscopy ebn uh, you you can reach up to 92 percentage of um, diagnostic yield uh, so, um, so that, that's okay you are, we are we are going uh, uh, i mean in par with uh, uh, the the western standards so uh, that's all uh, dr patabi yeah sure thanks reni so i think to sum up uh, anesthesia is again A regional perspective what suits you is better but we always have a, you know it, it's personal preference we would use a general anesthesia for such uh, purposes especially if it's a, a smaller lesion and if there is a propensity to move around would rather use a general anesthesia but again, again it's not that you cannot do it without uh, general anesthesia so again it's a personal preference it can be done so the most important thing to uh, you know understand is these things can be done peripheral lesions can be accessed through bronchoscopy with an adequate setup uh, i think uh, it's it's quite doable so i think we'll switch gears uh, from here and i'll i'll ask uh, my good friend nagarjun to uh, give give some uh, uh, insights into uh, 
uh, interventions in uh, asthma and COPD. I think these are exciting days for uh, thing. Over to you, Nagarjun. Thanks a lot, sir. So hope, hope I'm audible now. Yes. So I think this is a very interesting uh, uh, talk. Is therapeutic interventions for small airway diseases? See, because we always here we always go to workshops for large airways. You have a lot of rigid bronchoscopy workshops, but then there's little talked about this upcoming evolving uh, uh, role of bronchoscopic interventions. That is for small airway diseases. So starting off with uh, what is the latest thing in the market that is BTVA, bronchoscopic thermal vapor ablation. So it's a type of bronchoscopic lung volume reduction surgery. So the BLVRs, you have the valves, you have uh, coils, you have the seals, you have BTVA. But in our country, the only thing we have is bronchoscopic thermal vapor ablation. So to very briefly uh, make you understand, so what exactly it is. So in emphysema, we all understand that it's a uh, it, it, it leads to hyperinflation. So there are certain segments which are hyperinflated and this leads to the sensation of dyspnea, poor quality of life and they also compress the adjacent healthier segments. So in any BLVR, what, do, what we do is we identify these hyperinflated segments and then you ablate them. So what happens is the, the, the diseased overinflated segment collapses, the hyperinflation comes down and the healthier segments become better functioning. So this is the very, very brief understanding of how a BLVR actually works. So in BTVA, it is the heated vapor which is given to ablate the segment. So this we have launched this uh, uh, this uh, technology in India around the five to six months before. So very briefly, I'll just discuss one of our first cases. So he's the, obviously a person with uh, severe uh, emphysema. The patient selection is between four, usually 40 to 75 years. Uh, heterogeneous emphysema is what BTVA has currently been recommended. So we don't do it for homogeneous emphysema. It should be an upper lobe predominant heterogeneous emphysema. Obviously, the person should be symptomatic despite optimal medical therapy. So which means he should already be on good triple inhalers, rehabilitation, all uh, sort of mucus clearance techniques, vaccination, and so on and so forth. But what is important is that there is there's also some safety exclusion criteria, which means if the person is too sick, again, you can't consider BTVA. So if a fever and DLC is below 20%, if he cannot walk even 140 meters, more than three exacerbations, hypercapnia more than 50 mm, hypoxia below 45 mm, so these are all the things where you should not do BTVA because of lack of data uh, to be used in this sick cohort. So what we have to understand is that there is something called as the golden window period, wherein if the person is stable, then you don't need to do it. If the person is too sick, then you have missed the window of opportunity. So you have to identify the patients of emphysema in this golden window, wherein you can do the procedure and then give the person a meaningful clinical benefit. So the first person we have done is a 65-year-old male, a smoker, reformed smoker, a businessman, symptomatic with COPD on triple therapy, eagerly awaiting relief from dyspnea. The first and foremost thing which we have to do is to get a good quality volumetric CT. So what all do we do on a CT is you look for emphysema, distribution of emphysema. This is There is a special software called the IP3 software which will give us the, the quantitative analysis of the fissures and the segments. Here if you can see all the three fissures here are incomplete. So BTA is one BLVR procedure wherein the fissural completeness is not required unlike valves this is an advantage of btva over the valves and you can see the volume of segment they had the head the emphysema percentage everything quantitatively it is being projected here uh, so all the segments which have emphysema score of more than 40 percent can be considered and a heterogeneity index of more than 1.2 so this is all done by the software and then it will give us which all segments are available for therapy so this person again was worked up properly, a fever of DLC or 30-32%. He was, he was sick but not too sick for the procedure. And then you choose the segment. Here we chose LB3 segment, that is the anterior segment of the left upper lobe for the first sitting. Again, the, the, the amount of vapor to be delivered, the time, everything will be predetermined. So it's technically a very simple procedure. So this is the first case where we were doing the procedure. And you can see the catheter, which is there rightly positioned. A very small video clipping. So this was the bronchoscopic video. Quickly go to the area area of interest. Uh, so this is the left main bronchus. So you go to the left upper lobe here. LB3 is the segment where we want to do. So once you identify the segment, so this is done under anesthesia because we don't want the patient to be coughing. The catheter is slowly advanced into the segment. Then you inflate the balloon. So the balloon is inflated so that whatever vapor you give is localized to that particular segment. And then once you, you ensure that the good seal is there, then it is just one click. 
everything is set and then it is done so here you can see after the procedure you can see the blanching so nicely the all the sub segments are blanched so blanching indicates a good delivery of vapor into that particular segment so this is how a btva procedure is done again images you can see the blanching here here was the balloon and distal everything is blanched this is the transient infiltrates which are seen after the procedure and uh, we have done four cases as of now all of them 65 to 75 if even between 30 to 45 percent one one segment per procedure no interprocedural complications two of them had mild exacerbations uh, one month after the procedure one of them requiring admission but all of them have improved clinically the exact the objective parameters we have calculated i'll be presenting in the copd summit so these are the three patients who are very happy and come back to share their experiences after the first session of btva so what are the advantages of btva over blvr is that you don't you you can do even when there is collateral ventilation there are no implants left inside so no infection it's a segmental approach so complications are lesser lesser pneumothorax and most importantly it is there in our country drawbacks it's a very small sub segment of people it's a minuscule i would say of the number of copd you see and the number of people eventually end up qualifying for this thing it's a very small segment but then in them it will do a benefit the other problem is the cost the catheter is around 2.8 lakhs so people have to be able to afford it so to summarize it's a, it's definitely a ray of hope though to a small sub segment of people and i would call it as reversing the irreversible so emphysema is by definition irreversible but you are actually reversing the physiology of emphysema so this is about btva yeah, thanks naga just for for this, uh, for a fascinating uh... Uh, you took us to a fascinating journey of what uh, interventions can do in terms of uh, you know handling these unfortunate patients with uh, small airway diseases asthma and copd uh, so uh, thanks nagarjun i think there will be a lot more of questions uh, for for you i think we'll we'll uh, uh, keep it to the question answer sessions uh, uh, i think let's move away from uh, these two and just uh, go to some uh, common issues i would like to call uh, atri for this and uh, atri what is your uh, uh, take on uh, uh you know icu bronchoscopy is it yeah thank you sir for the question icu bronchoscopy is is a part of therapeutic bronchoscopy and initially before bronchial thermoplasty or btva and foreign bodies maybe icu bronchoscopy was the only ambit of therapeutic bronchoscopies initially there used to be a cautious approach that in pneumonia cases you can send a et aspirate if the patient does not improve then consider a bronchoscopy but the problem lies is when in covid and post covid when we were seeing this horrible infections not responding to anything that a patient survive covid lands up something very badly and then what happens this patient if you don't act immediately you are going to lose this patient and this was not only about bacteria but it was about atypical mycobacteria relapse of tb fungus and what not so now it has become my practice and i'm very sure very soon in the international recommendations for management of severe care it will be that the moment you intubate a patient you do a bronch get an aspirate before putting that dose of antibiotic or even if you don't intubate a patient but if it is a severe cap based upon your clinical features or radiology do a bronch get a lavage from the affected area it will help in guiding the treatment i am sure it is going to come up in the recommendations very soon because whenever we are talking about a severe pneumonia landing up in icu it may be a mdr pathogen it may not be a bacteria at all so rather than waiting those golden 48 hours not not doing something which is not working go for that if you ask anyone and i, I would want to use this stage that what should be the size whenever i am talking about a critical care bronchoscope icu bronchoscope the preferable outer diameter should be less than 6 cm why because sorry not 6 cm 6 mm why because basically the patient is intubated now when the intubated the op, ideally the et size for intubation is 7 or above if it is size is 6 only then it can go comfortably through the et tube secondly if the patient is not intubated but there is lot of oxygen requirement patient in his niv a working channel less than 6 can comfortably go in rather than something which is about 6 because here we don't need to put in any needles via the bronchoscope any forceps or whatever it may be just required for suctioning or it will be just required for lavage and when 
you have a smaller channel then one size fits all so that same scope can be used even for children the same scope can be even used for adults now whenever we are talking about ic bronchoscope the biggest debate that has come up in recent years and there have been quite some papers published in the last 6 month regarding single use bronchoscope whenever we are talking about scenarios of covid post covid bad infections meaning the sanctity of the scope for the next patient can be an issue it should not be that while trying to save a patient we are introducing an even worse infection in the new patient so there has to be a cost benefit analysis regarding usage of single use patient i can understand that single use scope currently may be costly per procedure but if you look at the advantage with respect to avoidance of new infection in a critical patient may be over a period of time in the next 2 years the cost of the single use scope will even come down and they may, may become the norm for such kind of icu scopies that's fascinating thanks for the inputs uh, i mean there might be a little bit of a controversy here and there but that can be discussed so uh, and finally i think uh, i'll also uh, pick the brains of uh, rennes tb is a very common problems and interventions uh, as as a, uh, you know uh, as a tribe the intervention is uh, growing up and i think uh, there is definitely role for an interventional pulmonologist in tuberculosis your thoughts on that uh, uh, rennes yeah yeah if you look at it tuberculosis alone there it can involve any areas like not only the airways it can involve the mediastinum or the pleural or, or um, um, uh, anywhere so uh, you may have to take up uh, your uh, ebers uh, and uh, sometimes you have to go ahead with uh, um, uh, usb fna for uh, sampling of uh, mediastinal nodes uh if, if it's a bronchoscopy i i mean i'd say if it's an effusion you have to take up your uh, thoracoscope um and uh, get the diagnosis um, and uh, then sometimes you may have to use the cryo for chronic infections including uh, to exclude um, uh, the tuberculosis as well um and uh, that's all for the the the, the diagnostic part of it then uh, if you look into the the therapeutic part uh, sometimes um, uh, or the stitches it causes uh, or uh, any uh, luminal narrowing it causes uh, you, you you can use whatever whatever you feel like uh, sometimes uh, uh, give an airway with uh, some um, uh, re, uh, i mean uh, silicon strands or something like that kind of um, and sometimes the 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 problem it causes with uh, the bronchopleural fistulas or sometimes bleed and all all this uh, needs uh, different stuffs like uh, you may need as spigots or um, uh, for, uh, for le leaks uh, you may have to do, you use some uh, um, uh, what you call the autologous blood patch or um, you you have to seal off those uh, areas um, even the sealants uh, which uh, dr nagarjun nagarjun was uh, describing you can use all these um, to seal off the area so uh, i think this uh, you know this uh, interventional pulmonology um, uh, innovations uh, should become some standard of care um uh, and should be incorporated in our uh, guidelines so uh, uh, even if it's a plural uh, guide, guide uh, plural, uh, plural guidelines or tb guidelines uh, as uh, uh, we have seen the ibis tbna has uh, replaced the mediastinoscopy our uh, this um, even the what dr nagarjun was talking about in uh, uh, obstructive airway diseases uh, the bronchodermoplasty uh, uh, these are all referenced in the gina and also in uh, gold guidelines uh, the lbrs has come up so same way the interventional pulmonary pulmonology activities what we do uh, they shouldn't be restricted to the, the small case series uh, whatever giving uh, the uh, the the uh, safe uh, efficacious and uh, uh, better for the patient uh, we should take up those things to the guidelines um thanks renes i think that is a good note to actually uh, wind this up actually we had a very good uh, session which involved uh you know practical issues that the day to day in indian uh, pulmonologists face we started off with a you know a pressing problem of diagnostic uh, you know uh, challenge we discussed briefly on that we discussed almost every aspect that an average indian, indian pulmonologist face you know asthma copd tuberculosis uh, icus and so on so i think uh, uh, with with this uh, short time i think we were only able to cover this and uh, based on what happened to the napcon we just picked a few topics and we tried to give you a, a birds eye view and i i would thank all my panelists for uh, for being there and uh, giving me this uh, you know uh, the overview 
and uh, i think uh, it was fascinating to look at what technology is helping helping us and helping our patients and all these at an indian cost i think that is where uh, you know the the uh, fascination is if you call if you compare the procedures for instance what nagaraj uh, nagarjun or uh, renes or uh, atri does is is actually about a minuscule of what happens elsewhere with the same kind of outcome and i think that is where uh, we have this indianness to the whole uh, thing and so i thank all my panelists and i i thank again uh, uh, mankind uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity and uh, this time to wind up guys and i'd be happy to take some questions uh, at the end thank you so much thank you uh, patabi sir and the three panelists and you have been as agile and as lively as you were at the first time when i saw you and i think the panel would have further inspired fresh graduates in pulmonary medicine to take up interventional pulmonology as a sub specialty in their career so bidding adieu to you and panelists we move to the second panel of the day on pulmonary vascular diseases which actually is a less dramatic and relatively silent group of diseases but with very grave consequences and to take us forward on this panel we have none other than dr nitin nabiyankar the scientific chairperson for the entire three day event whose astute thinking and design of faculty as well as topics is showing very rich dividends when it comes to the success of this program as a pulmonologist with almost three decades of clinical practice and research experience sir is currently the senior consultant and head of the department of pulmonary medicine at the pune hospital and research center pune an inevitable and integral personality whose presence definitely adds color to all academic events in pulmonary medicine at the national level he has lots of lectures publications etc and is a popular mentor for junior consultants in pulmonary medicine across the country it is my pleasure it has been my pleasure uh, being with sir in various academic forums and i have had the opportunity to learn a lot from him especially his ability to smile and keep his composure in very challenging situations uh, so with this word sir i request you to take over proceedings for the second uh, panel discussion on pulmonary vascular diseases thank you dr rajesh for this very kind introduction and uh, we welcome you to this case based panel discussion on pulmonary vascular diseases uh, please uh, allow me to have the liberty that they are not 100% pulmonary vascular diseases but there are pulmonary vascular diseases in all the cases that we are discussing i have a few interesting cases and i have a much much more interesting panel with me and of course uh, dr deepak matreja from nagpur is joining us on this panel He is MBBS, MD, DNB, MNA, MS, European Diploma in Adult Respiratory Medicine, European Diploma in Pediatric Respiratory Medicine, FCCP, Consultant Interventional Pulmonologist at Viveka Hospital, Nagpur. He is, as you said, Hermes diplomate like me. He is proficient uh, adult as well as pediatric. Proficient in performing bronchoscopy and thoracoscopy procedure. More than two thousand bronchoscopies to his credit, diagnostic as well as therapeutic. He has performed more than two thousand, uh, sorry, two hundred medical thoracoscopies. He's a co-author in the article accepted for presentation in the ERS Summit two thousand seventeen. Two rare case presentations uh, of uh, rare endobronchial leiomyoma from a single center, and uh, he's also a co-invis co-investigator in studies of antibiotic prescription patterns from treating respiratory tract infections from across ICUs in India. Selected for Poster presentation in ERS Summit in two thousand sixteen, and co-author in article on central neurogenic hyperventilation, secondary to primary CNS mantle cell lymphoma. So, with that introduction, here is Dr. Deepak Mathurja for you. Thank you. The second panelist is from Delhi, Dr. Rahul Sharma, MD, DNB, FNCCP, FCCP, FI, DSA, DM Pulmonology. head of the department and senior consultant in pulmonology critical care and sleep medicine in yathart hospital noida he is well versed with the recent advances in pulmonology many national and international publications to its credit vast experience with a gold medal in critical care and sleep medicine his special interest areas are obstructive airway disease severe asthma management interventional pulmonology both diagnostic and therapeutic interstitial lung diseases biological and respiratory diseases sleep medicines and polysomnography and various home ventilations so welcome dr rahul sharma and last but not the least surely is dr vishweshwaran md dnb dn from 
uh, who has done a fellowship of interventional pulmonary and sleep medicine, a consultant interventional pulmonologist in Yashoda Hospital, Hyderabad. And he again is a Europe uh, Hermes diplomat. So I think three of us are Hermes diplomat. I am now an ex Hermes diplomat. So publications around 20, including review articles, original research in national and, and international index journal oral and poster presentations of original research in various national and international conference, reviewer in respiratory medicine, PubMed index, uh, national journal Lung India, executive member of guideline formulation of nebulization practices in India, course director of IP uh, meet and again field of interest IP in a deep way, interstitial lung diseases, thoracic oncology and airway disorders. So I have this August panel with me and I think they are surely going to teach me something uh, as well as the audiences. And uh, for that, I am going to start with the first case. So here oh, is our first case. And uh, this is a 50 year old male diabetes, not so regular on therapy, getting fever off and on for a few days, cough and vitis expiratory, sudden onset of acute respiratory dyspnea, chest pain with a hypoxemic respiratory failure. So with that, we look at this X-ray and uh, can somebody uh, from the panel say, Dr. Rahul, can we start with you? Yeah, thank you very much for uh, being uh, for inviting me for this panel. I think this is a wonderful case and the, probably the diagnosis is very, very, very clear cut here that patient has got pneumothorax, which was the cause of sudden onset of symptoms in this patient, but we can see the cavity in the right upper lobe that, that also needs to, you know, that get some evaluation because of the underlying cause which causes this pneumothorax. So pneumothorax right. with right upper lobe cavity is probably what we are looking at in this x-ray. Correct, correct. So I'll move ahead. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we had to put in a drain straight away. There was no question. The patient was a little too hypoxic and needed an NIV support. And the FIO2 requirement was anywhere between 80 to 100 for the first two or three days. There were, we had initiated broad spectrum antibodies in the form of uh, meropenem was at that point in started. And of course, a CT scan with the, was done eventually once the patient stabilized a bit and it showed a large cavity in the right upper zone. And also pulmonary embolism was documented in the right upper lobe pulmonary artery. I unfortunately don't have those images, but this is the expanded lung and you can visualize this large cavity. So with this, uh, uh, can I ask uh, uh, what would be your threshold for, uh, you know, because there was no sputum available at that point in time, uh, patient is on NIV. So how early would you think of doing, say, a bronchoscopy? Would you be doing it in the ICU on ventilator? What what would be uh, your top uh, thoughts on that? So uh, we can ask uh, Dr. Deepak and Dr. Vishweshara. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. So, the bronchoscopy should, uh, according to me, the bronchoscopy should be done as soon as possible because we would be getting the microbiological analysis. Since there is a large, huge, thick walled cavity, what we can see on an X-ray, yeah. and there is a pneumothorax, and you have also shown that there is associated PE. Yeah. Uh, the microbiological analysis uh, would be very necessary to initiate him on the proper antibiotics as well as, if required, we are in a TB endemic country. Sometimes uh, tuberculosis may be also there and uh, the patient can have a pneumothorax secondary to the cavitatory lesions. Correct. So I think tuberculosis so, one, even mucor for that matter, mucor, but though, yes. yeah, even that, that would be. So okay. I think uh, if, I, if I may add, so the yes, patient yes, was yes. diabetic, cavitatory yes. disease, uh, yes. you know, pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism and on NIV. Probably yeah. the ICD site is also a good site from where you can take the sample rather than doing an, yes. a bronchoscopy on NIV for this Absolutely. cavity evaluation. And sometimes it can also give you a good diagnosis. So the tube is already there. You just have to take the sample and send it for analysis. Absolutely. That is also a good way initially to screen these patients. Perfect. Perfect. We are, we are spot on and that is what luckily we had done. So I'm going to start showing you one by one what was available. And uh, I think we'll move ahead because we may not otherwise go through all the cases. So pleural fluid, you can see the glucose is high because of the possibility diabetes, but there is a, uh, you know, 4.72 is definitely a exudate and with huge uh, 
uh, WBC count, which is 12,800. So, and all nearly all neutrophils. So I think suggestive of empyema. We did not have at that point in time on the gram stain uh, or ZN stain, there were no organisms detected at that particular point in time. So uh, we did a bronch all the same because we thought empyema, but then, you know, where we sure or not. So what I saw, actually, I'm seeing red here on the images, but we saw thick white secretions, which were coming from the right upper lobe and uh, both posterior and anterior segments. And uh, the gram stain was, of course, sent for the relevant workup, which included AB gene expert, AB culture, sensitivity, fungal culture, and uh, routine, routine culture set as, as we would do. And the reports, of course, the micro, uh, gene expert was the first to arrive, which was negative. But the ZN stain started showing thin acid fast filamentous branching structures, suggestive of nocardia species. Now, uh, is that good enough? Or would you want to have more? Or would you treat the patient on the basis of uh, uh, nocardia report alone? I mean, on the on the day. Is, so can I ask? So I think think you're not spoken yeah, so far. Uh, sir, uh, since we have a very pertaining uh, uh, background where the patient is having diabetes and with radiological evidence of cavity and you have a microbiological evidence of nocardia which presents either as a mass or a cavity, I think we should take this report as positive for nocardiasis and we should start treating this patient at the earliest given the clinical severity of the condition. So here, I would have definitely started this patient on treatment for nocardia. But before starting the patient on treatment for nocardia, I would also like to evaluate for CNS because anytime when we see a patient with nocardia, two organ systems which we should be concerned is about the skin and the CNS because right. nocardia is known to disseminate to these two sites. So, so you have to look into the either at least a CT uh, brain to see any CNS involvement of uh, nocardia is there or not. And yes. I would have definitely started this pa patient as a case of severe nocardia cavitary pneumonia with at least a trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole and an injectable like an imipinum given yeah. the severity of the clinical condition. Excellent points. All excellent points. In fact, we did a brain CT, which was normal. And then we, of course, TMP, SMX and meropinum was continued because that was the first antibiotic which we started. And then with the, with the kind of a very rapid response, it was... Uh, a, I am going to ask you one just just a teaser here that because we had sent a galactamenon on day one itself and it was just borderline raised. So would that change my diagnosis or I'll still stay with necordia for the time being? In case, uh, let's assume if this patient did not have an alternative etiological diagnosis, then given this clinical and, condition, I would yeah. have treated as a case of probable invasive aspergillosis. But since this yeah. patient already have an etiological diagnosis of nocardia, I think this, we shouldn't take it on the, uh, on the uh, up front. But yeah. having said that, during the time of COVID, we have seen nocardia coexisting with invasive aspergillosis and mucormycosis also. So Perfect. in this case, I would have treated only for nocardia, but in due course, if the clinical condition is totally not improving, then I need to have a high suspicion that there could be a coexistent exactly. fungal infection as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. The point very well taken. So I think the, the cytology came and cytology again showed filamentous bacteria morphologically resembling nocardia. And uh, the patient kept on doing very well. In fact, this was a genuine nocardia. So five days later, we could remove the ICD. The patient weaned off NIV over one week, which was, of course, the, it must be a combination of the pulmonary embolism as well as this. So the LMW was eventually converted to Rivorexaban and 15 milligrams twice daily for the first three weeks and then given 20 milligrams daily for first five months or so. Uh, I have, uh, and this is what this eventual prescription included. Uh, please pardon me for the brand names. I'm not going to utter them, but then TMP SMX in a full dose, this was given for one full year and we continued this for about five months and then we stopped it. So are there any thought processes on this? How long would you give no in this? And would you consider a thrombophilia profile in a person who's having this kind of a PE, which is infection associated? Any of you can take this, please. So, uh, sure, yeah, sir. you may go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, here there is no point in doing a prothrombotic workup because you have a 
patient who has already been initiated on an anticoagulation and you have and infection per se is a prothrombotic uh, state so any patient who presents with a uh, acute thrombotic events the guideline clearly says that there is no point in evaluating this uh, prothrombotic uh, status because it is not going to change the management the real role of evaluation of this prothrombotic state really comes when you have finished the course of anticoagulation let's say 3 to 6 months and you are in a dilemma whether you need to continue this patient on lifelong anticoagulation or not so you need to give an anticoagulation free interval and then evaluate the blood parameters for a prothrombotic state at that point of time so i wouldn't have done a prothrombotic workup where i have an attributable etiology probably sepsis and uh, high uh, uh, pulm and uh, nocardias can in few cases have embolism and uh, so i would have treated him and maybe if i really wanted to see if this patient is having a prothrombotic i would have done in a stable state after discontinuation of anticoagulation absolutely fine any other view points on this i mean we are i think we are in agreement on this i am in agreement so can i move ahead so we'll we'll go ahead and of course i mean this is the sort of final nail in the coffin that culture both the cultures from the bal as well as plural fluid showed the nocardia species convincingly and there was no other organism absolutely ever detected the even on uh, ever so i think this case was a pure nocardia with a pulmonary embolism so we move on to the case two we have spent 15 minutes in the first so we have now 5 minutes each for each of these three cases so 68 year old lady with worsening exertional dyspnea over 6 months once in couple episode presented with hypoxia and orthopnea in the icu finally like what many of these patients do and i want you to uh, say dr dr deepak uh, can you start with this or dr rahul any of you so this x is showing a huge cardiomegaly with there is like hyaluronic uh, prom- prominence most probably it is because of the pulmonary arteries this yeah. is what i can say on the crazy it's difficult to believe that but uh, and then what uh, you would think in terms of a severe pulmonary hypertension isn't it in this situation so because nothing else obviously is there but i i think i'm i'll all the same i'll go ahead and show you what is there on the 2d echo this is a dilated ra and rv with rv dysfunction d shaped lv cavity uh, no other lv lv ejection fraction is good and then uh there is uh, rvsp is around 67 ivc is dilated and non collapsible and uh, if i think these parameters are not related to the rv in any case so dilated ra rv dysfunction a normal lv systolic function and a severe pulmonary hypertension uh, any comments on this anything else you want to emphasize are you going to look anything in the eco per se or i'll move ahead i think and and somebody can talk about this which uh, dr rahul my colleagues anybody can comment on this i'll show you the few other images also so there is a uh, if we go to the mediastinal window uh, yeah. there is a presence of uh, the pulmonary trunk looks hugely dilated which is more in diameter in comparison to the aorta so definitely there is an this is a clear cut case we don't have anything there is a uh, pulmonary hypertension and the important thing to see in this is is there any filling defect but luckily at least in the sections that are showed there is no evidence of any filling defect so it could be a, it is definitely a pulmonary hypertension but it is non thrombotic uh, yeah. pulmonary hypertension correct so i'll come to this question and i think we can uh, have your choices on this what are your choices today if you see somebody like this with a severe pulmonary hypertension first time what are you starting is it going to be uh, still sildenafil fail or is it mesentan or what is your first choice or is it riosigoat like you know of course that is more ct ph here here it is a primary pulmonary hypertension so what are your choices uh, dr vishwesh you seem to be the only one connected so please I'll... <laughs> so it depends uh, we choose the uh, pulmonary anti pulmonary hypertension drugs depending upon the who functional status Correct. so we have got three different uh, arms one that acts upon the prostacyclines and the phosphodiesterase inhibitors the second is on the endothelin antagonistic and the uh, third one uh, is what we have the guanylin cyclase pathway so 
for who class 1 we generally start with a single agent but if the who is class 2 and 3 and above the recommended uh, modalities you start them on a combination therapy pr- preferably with an endothelin receptor antagonistic along with the phosphodiesterase inhibitor which will be most commonly in the form of an ambrisentan and tadlafen okay uh, but uh, before doing all these things if you are dealing with a pure case of pulmonary hypertension the workup should also include a sleep study to rule out nocturnal hypoxemia and <laughs> you should do a right heart catheterization to confirm the presence of pulmonary hypertension which in this case would probably be there and along with that you can do a vasoreactivity testing in the vasoreactivity testing in case if you are having presence of vaso reactive response then you can try calcium channel blockers like a nifedipine of 30 mg or a dilzum of 120 mg but most yeah. of the pulmonary hypertensions do not show vasoreactivity so in other cases we treat with this initially we start with this combination like an ambrisentan and tadlafen and in case if the patient is not improving then we will step up to prostacycline analogs like an inhaled iloprost or a subcutaneous uh, trepoprostan okay. so you, right now inhaled uh, iloprost can be procured in india on compassionate grounds but i am not very sure if we have a dealer or not and as mm-hmm. dr nitin ambedkar sir has already said we will not choose a rioc got in this case because that is a primary indication was a ctf So, so here my choice would be an ambrisentan with the tadalafil combination, not improving. Go ahead for a pro- prostacycline analog, either in the form of an inhaled iloprost or a, a tra- subcutaneous trepoprostanil. But in that case also, if the patient is not improving, then primarily you need to consider heart-lung transplantation. That would be the primary solu- end solution for such cases. Thank you, Dr. Nitesh, for this exhaustive answer. And uh, Dr. Deepak, any comments on this? Uh... any anything the, else I think the, the similar strategy what this is same what we are using yes absolutely and uh, rahul uh, are there i think uh, vishwas was a- absolutely bang on that we have these three arms in terms of uh, medical therapies and if medical therapy doesn't work or we believe that most of the time it doesn't work for patients yeah. who has group 3 ph probably lung transplantation is the only answer if the patient is fit for that i have one patient in my district who's been lung transplanted for a severe pulmonary hypertension that was initiated by dr mahavir and uh, it was uh, it's a successful transplant heart lung we had to do both because young very young lady so i think that was one last resort though it is last resort i i just ask one last probing question because the mortality statistics are best with mesentan uh and uh, embrisentan not so much so so is there a differentiation between the two or they are the same according to you the liver toxicity profile is much worser in terms of uh, mesentan so uh, so you'll be a little combination okay. drugs are easily available in india with embrisentan tadlafil so yes. so we prefer that as the first one these two are preferred okay fine so we will move on because of the brevity of time we'll have around 8 minutes for the next two cases okay so it gets shorter so fastest fingers first 51 year old lady with recurrent large hemoptysis uh, x ray and ct scan suggestive of a mass lesion in the right lower lobe once again you have to imagine it on the basis of the film that i'm showing a pet ct was done which was because of the mass lesion but then there was nothing uh, either showing either malignancy infection or inflammation uh the bronchoscopy done thrice because of this hemoptysis I had located a bleeding source in the right lower lobe only once the, the other times it was bang normal no growth on all the cultures all bronchoscopies had stand gene experts and all the cultures fungal everything malignant cells and thing so then uh, you know i'm i'm going to just ask you a question of a differential diagnosis here and what would be your next workup so i think pet negatives pet negative mass lesion you are looking at with recurrent hemoptysis yes. one of the diagnoses is aspergilloma so yes. but it must have been picked up in uh, pet ct or the simple ct that we are doing yes. yes the other thing would be any ab malformation that we are looking at but most of the time when you give contrast it usually fills in so it doesn't give you a picture of mass lesion per se It's rather give to a conglomerate lesions which, uh, which is let me tell you the sequence they are done in the peripheral setups huh? so they were not right. done very intensively right. at that right. time and this is about 6 right. years ago yeah. yeah other than this all benign lesions can present but most of the time they does not bleed and probably the answer comes if it is a mass with a biopsy only 
so that is the thing yeah that would be that will be on the last thing so agreed so i'm not going to waste much time but look at the images and can somebody start describing what we are seeing here this is i'll show you all the three uh, four images i have so and then this is possibly the most uh, uh, obviously of them this is your right pulmonary artery as it has been shown and this is the right pulmonary vein which is engorged and then there are like multiple small feeders which are coming from this particular area and uh, well again multiple small feeders shown in in this and this is the beautiful image of a uh, av malformation where the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein have been uh, brilliantly sort of lined up in a sequential way so a confirmed case of a single av mal malformation this was not hht this was not osler weber randu uh so uh, would you coil this would you operate on this and uh, i mean therefore the alternative therapy so i think today the answer is coiling 6 years ago we did not have access to coiling very frankly so what what are your experiences on this uh, uh dr deepak and so firstly and we are uh, we were uh, thinking about grading the type of av malformation we can grade it according to 0 1 2 3 yes. and according to that we can have a therapeutic options for the patient zero okay. that is done on a transthoracic contrast echocardiography where you are using the agitated uh, saline and you are cal calculating the bubbles so it is like zero is uh, no bubbles one is up to 29 then 30 200 is grade 2 more than 100 is grade 3 So this is how categorize and accordingly you can go ahead with the uh, treatment options uh, it is like uh, if the feeder vessels is more than um, 3 mm it is better to do for go for coiling yes that is a better option correct so in this case uh, you have any experience of coiling because this particular case was actually advised a uh, coiling of oblique surgery and was lost to us but uh, eventually was lost to follow up but i think you have some experience and dr vishwesh also has some experience so please share with us uh, for, for a single lesion we have done this uh, coiling and the patient is uh, doing good and presently there is no hemopsis till now correct and uh, uh, and dr vishwesh so uh, the guideline clearly says that uh, if the av malformation uh, is symptomatic or if you have a feeding vessel which is more than 3 mm and the solitary lesion then the therapeutic modality of choice initially would always be an endovascular coiling so right. so in but in case if the endovascular coiling fails then the permanent solution is always a surgical resection of that thing so but always uh, remain sure so but uh, since uh, it is in this case also it is a localized lesion and uh, i don't know how many but it looks like it has got a multiple feeder rather than a single feeder so oh, yeah. it may require multiple coils uh, coil placement but in that case if it is not uh, successful then yes we may have to go for a lobectomy or a wedge uh, as per the surgical indication perfect that's right and dr uh, uh, rahul can i ask you about uh, uh, other complications related to pavms absolutely i think pavm you should treat it as a shunt that is happening inside the chest and it can cause you know stroke cerebral abscesses things can go di right directly from the uh, venous channel to the uh, the arterial channel and cause uh, you know cerebral symptoms to these patients and i would like to end on this coiling part also because please do please do what we had experience there was a you know beads which are coming pvc beads which we were initially using for you know obliterating this arteries and there there are chances of uh, complication in terms of spinal cord artery obliteration uh, with these beads but we coil that i think the risk is very very minimal because Correct. it stays there and there are there are less chances of spillers if you do it properly if the cardiologist or the interventional radiologist do it properly excellent i think that so we have to remember that the strokes and the abscesses cerebral abscesses which is again a known complication of cns in the involvement related to this pavms worth keeping in mind and look for them so the last case and we have now about 2 minutes so i think we'll quickly go through this and uh, i leave it to the editors to keep it or take it out 55 plus lady known case of right upper lobe uh, sorry left upper lobe please read this as left upper lobe bronchiectasis post tubercular with some suggestion of colonization by aspergillus because she has been bleeding a little bit repeatedly 
now gets a sudden onset of massive hemoptysis nearly 800 cc in 48 hours not controlled despite maximal supportive care and a bronchial artery embolization is done obviously in an emergency setting now this is the description that is a old case of cox with severe hemoptysis uh, right femoral axis under la excessive hypertrophied arteries with av communication and pulmonary venous opacification are seen in the left hemothorax these are supplied by the left bronchial artery as well as the intercostal arteries from d5 to d10 on the left side each of these arteries was uh, selectively cannulated and embolized good result and an eventful procedure wonderful story uh, sounds great but was I'll, I'll be showing you the good part of it and then we will discuss the bad part which happened that time so these are the two sets of images this is the one which is the first one on the upper side which is filling of those aberrant arteries and here after us and again one more image set here which is showing the arteries getting filled up in an extensive way with a leaking also going on whereas that is getting slowed down in the next image so with that they i because of the brevity of the time i will move ahead quickly and then patient had complete relief from hemoptysis however developed a placid monoplegia on the left limb within 18 hours of procedure and also had a little bit of a, a weakness of the right upper right lower limb but it was much much milder she also developed a bradycardia and had to be referred to cardiologist for that bradycardia because of the whole story going on and neurologic consult and mri confirmed that there was a left anterior spinal artery thrombosis now the this is the mri report which reads as dorsal spine shows t2 hyper intensity with diffusion restriction in the left half of the quad core predominantly at d5 level in the present clinical setting sorry uh, in the present clinical setting uh the imaging morphology suggests possibility of an acute infarct in the cord in the left side so actually and that's that's what the whole story was so we had to undo what we had done we had to give the patient clopidogrel plus aspirin and uh, luckily there was no further bleeding the patient kept gradually improving patient has a near complete recovery after 3 months uh, clopidogrel we could stop after about a month and aspirin stopped after about 3 months so uh, i was going through the literature in fact the neurologist shocked me with the percentage of around 6% so can you comment on this and why i play the video uh, so how common is anterior spinal artery thrombosis after a bronchial artery embolization is it possible to prevent it and then what are the consent related issues we are just two minutes ahead of the time so we'll finish it in any case whatever i think we'll complete the discussion and then let we leave it to the editors so the anterior spinal artery thrombosis is quite rare the various studies if we combine them the uh, chances are less than 5% uh yeah that's right so i i think i i i used to think it was even less than 1% and then uh, so so yes dr deepak you can go on so uh, regarding about to prevent it uh, that uh, uh, the sometimes there is like hairpin kind of origin is there for this uh, anterior spinal artery yeah so it is very difficult to prevent it if there is this uh, aberrant origin of this anterior spinal artery and regarding this about the consent points that we need to take due regards and we have to mention every possible complication in the consent absolutely for every patient whatever procedure we are doing yeah it came as a shock to all of us and it was not that well discussed with the patient well i mean you take consent ye ho sakta hai ho sakta hai in general but it is not a specific content ki you can get a sudden paraparesis paraplegia or something like that sort uh, anybody else uh, has any comments on this i think consent is very very important part and thankfully we also had this complication i think 2 years back yeah. thankfully our cardiologists who were doing these interventions were very very smart and they told all the complications still patient put a case on us oh wow But thankfully it was so so good that uh, there was nothing happened and over a period of time they have also realized but yeah. the probably the consenting part is the most important it's part the most most critical part isn't it in fact because we had a wonderful set of relatives so nothing happened really but at the same time and the patient recovered and i am going to show you that video uh, just after i think exactly after 3 months 
and uh, so this is a lady walking and now she says that there is no, no weakness whatsoever those of you who understand Marathi would have picked up that there are still parastasia and but and uh, there's a little bit of a spasm sir, there but this is largely recovered Arjun, sir, so I think uh, the, there are two important messages from this and therefore I have included this in this discussion though it is bronchial artery it's a strictly speaking systemic circulation not pulmonary circulation but the impact is in the lungs so therefore I have included it and more of because of the consenting issue and more because of this rare complication which we often don't take as a first priority there because we are dealing with a very badly bleeding patient and we are going to dramatically stop it and therefore the the heroism takes over and possibly you know we just underplay the rest of the story and can hit you badly once in a while and i hand it over uh, to dr rajeshvi for his moderation thank you very much thanks a lot thank you uh, nitin sir and uh, all the panelists you are all as precise and as on spot as mean, usual, everyone, the panel uh, has brought to life some of the less minute. focused and less discussed arenas in pulmonary medicine and uh, would hopefully be an eye opener for consultants who are less aware of pulmonary vascular diseases, including me. So we move to the last and final panel and perhaps a very much awaited panel, both based on the relevance in day-to-day -day practice as well as the faculty who are involved. And this panel is on asthma. To take us through this panel, we have none other than Dr. Deepak Talwar, whom, if I may be permitted to describe, is one of the top five clinicians, academicians, and researchers in our country in pulmonary medicine. He is currently the director of Metro Center for Respiratory Diseases, NOIDA, and he has ensured that state-of-the-art therapeutic as well as training facilities are in place in his department. Give a topic in pulmonary medicine, whether uh, it's uh, it's related to his area of interest or not, he handles it to such perfection in an extempore fashion and is a teacher, mentor and a guide to hundreds of trainees and young practitioners in the country. Asthma, especially severe asthma is a topic very close to his heart and he takes very keen interest in biological agent use in asthma and I request sir to guide us through the last and final panel of today on asthma. Thank you, Rajesh, and uh, good evening, everyone. Very kind introduction. And since we are already running late, I will quickly move on to the case of severe asthma panel discussion. And I'm extremely delighted to have Dr. Kumar Doshi, Dr. P. Arjun, as well as Dr. Subir Rahman. So we have three uh, excellent panelists with me. But if I remember correctly in the NAPCON, I think Arjun was the only one on this particular case, which he already knows about. <laughs> and Dr. Kumar, as well as Dr. Subin, are perhaps a little naive to this case. The idea to uh, have this case is that uh, uh, many a times in severe asthma, in fact, uh, uh, more than many times, there are no black and white. They are not clear cut boxes. And uh, we are invariably perplexed by the complexity of the situation where we already understand that severe asthma is not one disease. It's a heterogeneous disease and can manifest in many ways. We know that uh, almost about 4 to 5 percent of all asthma actually constitutes the severe asthma. So we are going to discuss uh, about this particular disease, which is not very common, but definitely it is a big issue as far as the pulmonologists are concerned because they are the ones who are seeing these patients primarily because they are uncontrolled. So this panel goes on with this case who is 74 years, a retired officer, known case of asthma for 40 years, non-smoker. He had an adult onset asthma. His triggers were viral res induced respiratory tract infections causing more of exacerbations as well as dust and fumes. He has a significant history of allergic rhinitis. He also gave comorbidities like GERD, significant uh, moderate obstructive sleep apnea for which he's using CPAP as he is obese with a BMI of 33 and he has some element of anxiety. Other uh, medical comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes and also he has undergone a total knee replacement in the past. 
He is on telmisartin, uh, chlorothalizodone, insulin, as well as oral hypoglycemic agents. So you can see that uh, uh, it's an el elderly male who's got multiple uh, allergic as well as non-allergic comorbidities. Quickly going over to his asthma control in last one year, what we find is number of exacerbations as well as hospitalization, poor asthma control, and a frequent use of oral corticosteroids, almost three to four bursts every year. And despite this, the, uh, despite the fact that the patient is already on formitrol, butosinide, teotropium, derifilin, as well as montolucas. So practically all other medications which are available to us at that point of time, the patient has been taking. And uh, he's uh, first time at the time when we evaluated him, he was actually with a very severe uh, attack where he required an emergency hospitalization in the intensive care unit. And he was discharged on oral corticosteroids. So overall, seven exacerbations, four hospitalizations in the last two years, which clearly indicates that uh, this patient is suffering due to the uh, asthma disease. This is a quick uh, snapshot view of chest x-ray, x-ray sinuses, as well as the HRCT of the uh, lungs. Looking at the lung functions, his uh, pre-bronchodilator uh, FEV1 was 50%, post-bronchodilator 52%, not much significant reversibility. And uh, the question which comes to the panel is that, is it severe asthma? So I think uh, we can start with the, uh, Kumar, uh, I can start with you. And I think we can go on quickly by this method that I'm going to, by rotation, ask uh, one question to one panelist, and if the other ones have uh, any difference of opinion, they can always pitch in with a quick and a very, very crisp comment. The comment is very simple, Deepak. Uh, this uh, fellow has had multiple exacerbations, and every time the therapy has been de-escalated, he has worsened. That really fits into the definition of severe asthma, which is a subset of difficult-to-treat asthma, which in turn is a subset of uncontrolled asthma. But that specific of worsening exacerbations every time you go down on a therapy and is already on GINA four, five lines of therapy fits into the bill. And yes, it is a severe asthma. Right. Any Anything uh, to add, Arjun or uh, Subin? No, nothing. OK. I think uh, very nicely, nicely said, uh, Kumar, that uh, this is a very, very well-worked up case where all the allergic comorbidities and other comorbidities, medical comorbidities have been addressed. He's been taking his medicines regularly and he's already on high-dose inhaled corticosteroids plus lava and all other possible medications which we are actually talking about. So uh, primarily the only distinction between uncontrolled asthma and severe asthma is that uh, you need to do at least uh, five steps in which you confirm the asthma diagnosis, which was very clear in this case. Uh, ongoing exposures were perhaps viral infections apart from giving the flu uh, vaccination. There's nothing else which you could do for that. He's adherent to th his therapy, he knows how to use his inhaler technique, and uh, we have addressed most of the comorbidities and psychosocial factors. And uh, considering this patient has uh, already been suffering for a long period of time, you have already optimized the therapy. There's no point in waiting further because this patient would have finally gone on to develop more exacerbation or hospitalization. And very important, the last one was a serious one which required the intensive care unit hospitalization. The adherence issues, compliance check was all done and uh, it was satisfactory. That moves on to the second question that... Uh, how do you phenoendotype your patients primarily of uh, uh, phenoendotype uh, for severe asthma in your practice? So for that, I'll go to uh, Arjun. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Deepak. Uh, uh, I'll address the second part of the question first. Do you need a severe asthma clinic? Yes, the answer is very much yes. Because we know that such patients, uh, as has been um, uh, seen in this particular case, they keep on suffering from the disease and they keep on getting exacerbation after exacerbation with admissions and repeated oral steroid use. And um, these are the patients who might, who will really benefit by screening in a severe asthma clinic. So the answer for the second part is yes. But the second question is how do you phenotype um, a severe asthma? Basically, it's by the use of biomarkers that we have. There are many biomarkers, but the ones that we commonly use in our practice um, basically, um, the, like this group of patients who fall in this, um, the, uh, the things that are easily available to us are the peripheral blood eosinophils, serum Ig, and pheno. 
sputum eosinophil estimation is a good way, but unfortunately, it's not easily available. The other things like periosteum are, of course, are more in the realm of research at this point in time. So basically, we depend on these three um, biomarkers to do a phenoendotyping of uh, severe asthma in our day-to-day -day practice. Right. Any Anything to add, Subin? No, sir. That would be it, sir. Uh, that would be phenos, uh, peripheral body eosinophils, Ig levels, and if possible, sputum eosinophils, which is the uh, sharpest marker. Right. Thank you, Subin. And uh, anything to add, Doshi? Yeah, Kumar. Yeah, uh, so, as Dr. Arjun rightly pointed out as to how are you going to phenol endotype, there is one very important caveat while phenol endotype. These tests should be done when these patients are mm -hmm. on the highest dose of vinyl corticosteroids. Uh, when they are not on an optimum dose of inhaled corticosteroids, and then you do, then you again increase the dose and see if those markers come down. So it's unless you have reached the ceiling of inhaled corticosteroids, we still uh, should be doing it that way. Right? So yeah, um, uh, Doshi, very rightly you have pointed out. Actually, what uh, what is the most important aspect is that we don't need to phenotype and endotype every asthma. It is only when they are on step five treatment right. that to pheno and or endotype them phenotypic is like what they look like so it's a clinical characteristics of the patient they are obese what kind of onset they have how many exacerbations they have what kind of the looks they have so those kind of things are phenotyping endotyping is where you are trying to find out what is the pathophysiology which is undergoing into the lungs of this patient which is producing these kind of exacerbation attacks need for oral corticosteroids as well as poor asthma control we generally combine this together only to find out whether this patient is for a targeted therapy. So phenoendotyping is primarily to look for targeted therapy. Let me tell you, if we are really not doing phenoendotyping, then there is, uh, uh, if we are not going to do a targeted therapy, then what's the point? So uh, non-targeted therapies are, which are available, which are actually working across all kinds of phenoendotypes. So if you are, have to choose a targeted therapy, you need to look for either type 2 or a non-type 2 because most of the therapies which are available for type 2 and type 2 is either eosinophilic or atopic and atopic is the IgE mediated. And Arjun has very rightly pointed out that eosinophilic, you have blood or sputum eosinophils, but we use blood eosinophils. And atopic is the one which is IgE mediated. Pheno is a good biomarker, but it is a biomarker of type 2 inflammation. It does not help us to distinguish between eosinophilic or atopic, but tells us that it is a type 2 inflammation. And if you don't find eosinophils, <coughs> if you don't find a specific IgE, then perhaps this is a kind of patient we are looking at is a type 2 low, which is uh, again for a separate type of uh, targeted phenoendotypic therapy. Uh, type 2 inflammation, as I said, is the one which is associated with a lot of allergic comorbidities, dermatitis, rhinitis, nasal polyposis, chronic sinusitis, ABPA, EGPA. But the very important aspect is that they are all exclusively sensitive to oral steroids. By and large, blood eosinophils of more than 300, pheno more than 20 is an indicator of type 2 inflammation, which is causing severe asthma in an individual patient. But the important aspect for phenoendotyping is also to distinguish between atopic and uh, eosinophilic asthma. For that, I will move this question to Dr. Subit. Uh, how do you uh, see this uh, uh, two types of phenotype and sorry, two types of endotypes in the phenotype of type two asthma? Uh, Ig mediated uh, atopic asthma, as you very rightly said, sir, is uh, uh, those people who are who are uh, ha having allergies. And it will be usually early onset and uh, their Ig levels will be high. And most importantly, they'll, they'll be positive to most commonly to inhale, allergic inhalants like uh, house dust or house dust mite. And uh, uh, whereas eosinophilic asthma, it's late onset and they won't be uh, having allergic symptoms as such. They might be having uh, nasal polyposis, but no chronic rhinosinusitis or allergen exposure exacerbation. And uh, uh, their symptoms and exacerbations are increased and uh, there will be uh, eosinophils more than 150 or more than 300 uh, uh, in uh, peripheral blood, uh, blood smears. And uh, both are uh, uh, oral corticosteroid responsive. But in eosinophilic asthma, if you see it is purely eosinophilic with, uh, without, uh, with uh, uh, pheno above uh, 20, and uh, eosinophil more than 150, then we'll have to go for uh, uh, targeted therapies. That is biologics for uh, uh, targeting anti-IL-5, anti-IL-5R, 
or anti IL4, uh, we will have to go for those uh, targeted therapies along with the step four and five uh, GINA treatments. Sir. Thank you, Subin. Uh, Doshi, you want to add something or Arjun? No, that's uh, no. Not okay. So I think the uh, very rightly said the important thing is that IgE levels do not indicate that it is IgE mediated atopic asthma. What determines is the early onset, childhood onset or uh, early adulthood onset. And very importantly, there has to be a correlation between the atopy and the identified uh, allergen exposure. So you can have skin prick test positive or you can have a RAST being positive where you will have a specific IgE positivity. In fact, when we talk about a biomarker, then perhaps an I specific IgE which correlates with the clinical symptomatology of the patient developing attacks on exposure is a much more important biomarker than a total serum IgE. So similarly, uh, in eosinophilic asthma, just raised eosinophil count is not an indicator that it is an eosinophilic asthma because you can again get high eosinophils in IgE-mediated topic asthma also. Here you generally have this phenotype that has a late onset. They have, uh, If they have allergies, they have IgE rays, it is not clinically relevant. And very importantly, they have chronic sinusitis with nasal polyposis, which is a very good hallmark to look at the eosinophils causing a lot of nasal symptoms in this patients. But very important, eosinophil asthma is the one in which eosinophil plays the major role. And eosinophil is a practically the most important villain in causing exacerbations as well as need for oral corticosteroid for the maintenance therapy. So in fact, any patient who's having recurrent exacerbations is requiring oral corticosteroids all the time and has got a eosinophil count, which is high. Even if IgE is high, it is indicated that perhaps eosinophil is the real culprit there rather than the IgE. Sometimes because of the steroids, which I think Dr. Doshi has very nicely brought in, that the levels of biomarkers may not be so accurate because of the oral corticosteroid use. And in those cases, what you need to do is drop the dose of a steroid a little bit and then check the biomarkers again. And you might find that the biomarkers levels started rising, which shows that they were practically suppressed only because of the oral corticosteroids. That again is an excellent indicator that eosinophil is the one which is not only getting suppressed by OCS, but is the main culprit behind. So this patient had an allergy test done, which was positive to house dust mite. His IgE specific uh, was also positive to house dust mite, along with that candida was also there. And when we looked at the biomarkers, his serum IgE total was 778. His eosinophil count was 230. His exhaled breath nitric oxide was 15 parts per billion. And of course, we didn't do a sputum for eosinophils. So with that, I come to Doshi that uh, how do you choose the targeted therapies for the patients in severe asthma? Well, uh, once you have really phenotyped them and found out whether they are IgE based or whether they are eosinophil based, we generally have only two paths at this point in time in the country available to us. The IgE based goes with the omalizumab group of drugs and the eosinophil, we go with the, uh, the interleukin-4 and the interleukin-5 uh, uh, antagonist. So right now, what we have available is only the IL-5 inhibitors and the IL-5 receptor antagonist, that is the mepo and the vendralizumab. Even the reslizumab is available as IL-5 uh, antagonist. So basically, once you have endotyped them, you will realize the path becomes very clear that if it's purely IgE-based, you stick to malizumab, and if it is eosinophil-based, you go for the IL-5 or the IL-4 inhibitor. Interestingly, even in the omalizumab group, the best response was still found where the eosinophil count was more than 250. So it all boils down, as you rightly said, that all the exacerbations somewhere or the other are quite significantly related to the eosinophil counts only. And in all the studies, whether it is omalizumab or whether it is the IL-5 inhibitors, the primary thing is reduction in exacerbations. And that's what is achieved. So the path is very clear. You have IgE-based disease, you have omalizumab, and you have an, IG, uh, 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 and you have an eosinophil-based disease. You are either with mepolizumab or bendrolizumab. That's the tool which are available in our 
the IL4 antagonist, Dupalimab, I do believe is still available in the market. Yeah, it's still not available and our life is not so difficult at the moment because we have to choose between A and B. Only thing is B. Very, very few things. <laughs> and B too. So there are two there in that. How do you use this? In uh, This is a question which I'll come to all three of you. So Arjun, how, how, how do you perceive this kind of, uh, you know, the choosing the biologics in uh, real life scenarios in the patients? Like I showed you the IgE is raised, house dust mite is positive eosinophil count is high and we have already seen the data that uh, this does not tell us a direct way of if you look at only the biomarkers it does not give you a clear idea that is it going to respond to O'Malley or to MEPO or Benrelli. How do you manage such kind of cases in your practice and I'm sure that uh, everybody sees this kind of overlap cases in practice. Thanks Deepak as uh, you said uh, basically we depend uh, not only on the biomarkers but more than that. So we can actually um, classify these patients into four major groups. Yeah, that's what it is, depending on the IgE levels as well as the blood eosinophil levels. On one hand, you have a group of uh, patients who have high blood eosinophil levels with IgE being low. For them, there is, of course, there is no doubt as what we are going to use, which could use either Meboli or Benrali. Uh, we have an, it, another group in which the IgE levels are quite high, uh, but um, Eosinophils are low. Again, there is no confusion here as what we are going to use. Mostly we can start with O'Malley. But as Dr. Kumar Doshi said, there are certain patients who might respond to the other drugs as well in this particular group. The third group in which you find that you don't have both the markers elevated, that both of them are low, then it becomes again easy. We have we don't have any targeted therapy to give for these group of patients for whom we could try non-phenotypic add-ons or um, drugs like macrolides or the, these might be the candidates for bronchial thermoplasty. And finally, we have a group which is quite which is not uncommon I would say that who has both increased IgE levels as well as blood eosinophil levels then of course the, that is the place where you have to decide on what drug you are going to start treatment with you have the option of starting with any of these three drugs and that depends on um, a lot of other factors as well I mean, whether there are any seasonal allergens to which the patient is more sensitive the affordability part of the patient as well particularly becomes important in our country if affordability is not an issue, you can start with um, Epoli or Benrali. But if affordability is an issue, then of course, for this group, you might have to start with Omalizumab. So this is uh, in short as uh, how to. Yeah, I think very nicely summarized that, uh, you know, if you are in a different boxes, then there is no problem. But the problem is only that upper right box where you get into a confusion and you have to take many other features of individual drugs, patients' preferences, their expectations. And as a, uh, though she said very rightly, look at the eosinophils again and again, that whether they are really the culprits or not. And uh, Gina has gone on to say that 240 is the level where the omalizumab works. And incidentally, this patient missed it by 10 and, is <laughs> and his eosinophils are uh, rise, uh, sorry, Ig is 778. So, Subin, what would be uh, looking at this? It looks like, you know, in this chart, which I have been using for pretty many years, that it looks like that this patient's choice is omalizumab. What, what is it? Definitely, sir. My take on this will be if the patient is having high Ig levels and if the, if the patient is positive to any uh, aeroallergens in allergy testing, and uh, uh, if the patient is still having uncontrolled asthma, my first choice will be always omalizumab. Again, uh, if omalizumab, if I give omalizumab for uh, uh, four to six months and if the patient is clearly a non-responder or uh, intermediate responder, then I would uh, look at the eosinophil levels. If that is pretty high, then I would uh, uh, think about switching from omalizumab to any of those anti-IL-5 maps. And uh, when it comes to uh, low IG, I mean, uh, lower... Uh, uh, like not too high Ig levels, uh, allergic uh, symptoms are not there. The patient is not atopic. It's purely eosinophilic. The eosinophilus is more than is more than 150. And the patient is a frequent exacerbator with uh, severe uncontrolled uh, symptoms despite optimal stage 4 and stage, stage 5 therapy. I would go for a uh, anti-IL-5 like uh, benralizumab or mepolizumab. Again, if one of them is not responding after four months, then I have a choice of, there had been evidence of uh, so one map not responding and switching over to another map, the patient responding after that. And when it comes to a known pH, a pH2 low, low asthma, which I would confirm only after doing at least three biomarker uh, tests uh, at different uh, separate occasions, if that is confirmed, then only, uh, only armamentarium we have is bronchial thermoplasty 
macroid antibiotics, azithromycin, weight loss. And uh, of course, some investigational agents are uh, now uh, Astra has come up with uh, tesepilimab, which is a uh, TS uh, thymic uh, stromal lymphopoietin uh, receptor antagonist and uh, uh, anti IL-33, which is in the pipeline. So this would be my uh, modus operandi in this type of cases, sir. Great, so Ben, great. So I must congratulate you for a beautiful, uh, you know, the depiction of what is there going to be in future also. So you have chosen omalizumab. I am already showing the graph. Arjun, you would also expect uh, omalizumab to be the first choice here or you would like to differ here? No, in this particular patient, omalizumab, yes. Yeah, so Doshi, your, your final comment and I move on. <laughs> Don't I would like to play the devil's advocate. Uh, I, 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 I back it up. Uh, deep of this case, uh, this gentleman had adult onset asthma. 40 years, so he, mid 30s or 40s, he got his asthma. His IgEs are elevated, but his eosinophil counts are more than 150. And if affordability is not an issue, I will sit down and discuss with him definitely. That I would uh, give him a shot straight away with an anti IL 5 inhibitor or a receptor antagonist over uh, okay. I really wanted somebody to say that that <laughs> I, I I I really I am so impressed by your comments that you said that uh, this is at the age of 74 where the age of onset is around 40 or 35 it's little latish as far as the omalizumab is concerned not that omalizumab won't work in this age group because it is known to but then, of course, your mind have been uh, really very thoughtful. And I think there is one more point which you have in your mind. You haven't told me. I'm sure in the as the case will fold, you will uh, talk about it. So anyways, the goals have been set. I will just skip the slides and come to that. That patient started on omalizumab. His dose turned out to be 600 milligrams once a month. And we continued. He had a exacerbation requiring oral bursts twice during that time. But when we, when we looked at a one-year data, we realized that uh, there is almost about 40% reduction in hospitalizations and exacerbations after starting the omalizumab. So I think, Subin, you said that, uh, you know, if you find that they are not doing good, there's suboptimal response, you would like to switch. So what would you do now? Whether you will... Sir, uh, actually, initially, the patient has responded to omalizumab and despite continuing omalizumab for more than six months, uh, his uh, symptom control and uh, exacerbation rates are not too good. I'm sure he, he would be having a poor ACT or AQ, ACQ score as well. So if omalizumab is, has failed, I'll definitely uh, try anti-IL-5 in this patient. Okay. So anything, uh, anything from Arjun, your side and Doshi? I do agree with what Subin has said in this particular patient. Right. So. I was just wondering, omalizumab, the only goal of omalizumab is reduction in exacerbations. In many studies, omalizumab has even failed to show the improvement in quality of life. So omalizumab, if you were to look at just this data, omalizumab seems to be doing its job, that it has reduced the exacerbations. But the devil is in the details. When you say that the admissions reduced by 40%, it sounds big. But when you say that the patient still had two exacerbations and one hospitalization, the second year of medicine, I'm not satisfied. He's still in and out of the hospital practically. So much so that uh, our threshold of hospitalization might have gone up. Like, well, please take 40 milligrams per loan. This time, maybe you'll be able to avoid and hospitalization. So from that point of view, it doesn't seem to have done its job. But when you look at Umalizumag and its data in detail, all it does is reduction in exacerbations and which it apparently seems to be doing. So uh, again, playing the devil's advocate, I would pat, uh, pat Umalizumag on its back and tell good job that you have been doing well, keep doing it good. <laughs> but when you look at the actual numbers, this sounds scary to me. So I would again go back on the table that IL-5. And the steroid use is also going up uh, as you yeah. move after yeah. Yeah. Uh, two years. Yeah. There's no OCS reduction after thank using omalizumab. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Subin. Thank you, Arjun. And thank you, Doshi. Uh, I was not that uh, <laughs> lucky. So I decided to continue omalizumab. 
the reason might have been totally different that uh, there was no other drug available at that that point of time there was, nothing, there was nothing that time so we we yes we we were able to reduce the number of exacerbations and hospitalizations but we were not able to bring it down so significantly to impress the patient so ultimately i think what brings down is that the goals needs to be set in with the patient and then patient's perspective and your perspective as well as what is expected of the drug has to match and if it does not match then obviously it will lead to something which is called as discontent among the patient that uh, and their caregivers that the drug didn't do the job which they were supposed to here the patient did realize that he was expecting about 50% reduction he's got 50% reduction he continued it for um, year 2 and then he finally stopped it because then uh, it was no longer available at that point of time and patient quickly went back to the same baseline therapy with ofomelizumab where requiring repeated burst hospitalization and again the thing started back now as everybody has said that uh, you know this patient right from the beginning was actually a patient perhaps would have been chosen as an anti il5 therapy rather than going for omalizumab but in those patients who fail we generally go through various steps because we find a lot of overlap as mine india almost about 30% of patients are in the overlap and if we look at the eligibility criteria 50% actually are eligible for both of them we need to identify the eosinophils and i think doshi has said right in the beginning that even if the eosinophil was 230 but exacerbations were being driven by the eosinophils perhaps the ige was a innocent by or not an innocent but it was an it was an important part playing in its exacerbations but not to the extent the eosinophils were and perhaps that's why we missed the the target which was perhaps uh, uh, you know might have been very happy or uh, happy or uh, making the patient very pleasant uh, experience of uh, you know getting a very good response from the drug so i uh, the most important aspect i think in uh, practice would be in such cases to look for all those clues that eosinophils is the culprit and not the ige in an individual patient rather than um, you know uh, going by the pure biomarkers you need to integrate the clinical features phenotypic features onset when was it adult or childhood or uh, what are the other non allergic situations as well as allergic comorbidities in it like this patient has nasal polyposis which is again something to indicate that the eosinophil is at uh, issue he had low fev1 he has frequent exacerbations all to indicate that perhaps uh, eosinophils and taking care of eosinophils would be a good choice in this patient uh, it was nothing available at that point of time so we had nothing other to give to this patient we chose to give him bronchial thermoplasty so any comments quickly because i think we are running out of time we have only about uh, another 5 minutes left but i would commend you on uh, just following the uh, 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 algorithm that uh, the biologics are not working and the next step has to be bronchial thermoplasty irrespective of the underlying pathology being driven by ig and eosinophils and like i would say it was a fantastic decision arjun and let's not be wise in the hindsight it was an amazing decision subin and arjun so that is the most logic thing that could have been done at that point in time for this particular patient right so sir then- again the same thing here sir uh nothing is working the patient is suffering with exacerbation oc is dependent the only thing in our armamentarium which had been proven uh with some benefit was bronchial thermoplasty and uh, any would have, anybody would have offered that right so he underwent three sittings second sitting was horrible he went into a severe exacerbation we had to keep him in the icu we had to give him a lot of steroids to take care of it and if you look at the number of actuations quite significant actuations and every time we did more and more and the number crossed more than 225 which is generally the predictor of success of bronchial thermoplasty for the patients and it did finally show some amount of improvement initially but then later on 6 months down the line post bt we, he again started noticing exacerbations and he went back to his previous kind of a situation and uh, again frustrating that despite the bronchial thermoplasty the patients were not doing good so finally at that point of time anything else to say this patient now had an eosinophil count of 390 looking at your look, looking at your slides i can only say when you get lost in a forest walk back trace back your steps and start walking again absolutely <laughs> it is like so stupid you feel so stupid that uh, you know that uh, why why did you go through this path 
I'll tell you why we went through that. But I suppose everyone actually once in a while do feel at heart that perhaps I could have taken a better decision. Looking at his 390 eosinophils, we said, oh, no, so we must give him a try of mepolizumab. And we did start a mepolizumab. He was doing excellent on mepolizumab, uh, actually mepolizumab. I didn't see him for almost nearly, uh, you know, this uh, one <coughs> Here, I did not even see him on my police map. He was doing so well. And this was a, especially a time where there was a pandemic going on and he was quite happy. And that point of time, he said that, uh, you know, he wants to have a therapy which can be twice in uh, once in two months rather than every month. And we shifted him to Benrali's map. He's doing even now excellent. And uh, we are following him up. Uh, the story of this patient is something which is... Uh, life of a severe asthmatics in India. So you can see that I have been following this from 2014 and it is now 2022. And finally on an NTIL-5 after getting PTA as well as NTIGE. So uh, these are the number of files or number of admissions this patient had. You can see that how many times he's been to in and out of the hospital because of the exacerbations. So I think exacerbations and oral corticosteroids are the two main uh, cornerstones where we want to take care of it by using the biological therapies. So any last minute comments, uh, Doshi, Arjun and Subit. We can go a slide back. I would label this slide as Dr. Deepak Talwar's visual analog score of asthma. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I'd like to add is uh, uh, Deepak, as you rightly said, and as this case but teaches us, and what has been very clearly mentioned in the GNI 2022 is that with a single um, um, value of a biomarker, you should never be happy and you should repeat it at some other point in time because these biomarkers keep changing over time. And so perhaps we might be able to pick up such patients who would really benefit from targeted therapy. Very right, I think. Subin, any comment from your side? And sir, the final thing is never give up. In the sense, if one fails, go for the other map. Because uh, what you did was publish in Allergy 2020 by Kavan Agatel. For those people who failed on map, they did very well on map. So you try the other molecule. I mean, never give up because we have to go, to, we, we got to offer something. And anti-IL-5s, I would say it has revolutionized uh, uh, phenotype-based asthma treatments. Right. So, so I just have one word of caution with biologics. Again, going back to this patient, he had elevated IgEs as well. We don't know why they were. Probably it was parasitic. India being endemic for parasites. Uh, if you have not ruled out that parasites and you are giving biologics, you might lead to dissemination of that disease. So just a word of caution. Yeah, very true, Dushi. I, I know that. Uh, but somehow, actually, we have uh, used omalizumab in more than 300 patients, never came across any patient, single patient where we had this kind of a problem. But it is always good to screen the patients prior to starting an anti-IgE therapy. So uh, I think, uh, Subin, you made a point very good that, you know, these are the targeted therapies which are going to arrive every day, every year, a new drug is going to come. And obviously, the new drugs which are going to become uh, are coming are, are a niche different where they may have a more targeted response in an individual patient who has failed on previous therapies. So, or suboptimal response to the uh, therapies. So, I think if suboptimal response is there, then that's an indicator that perhaps we have not targeted the right cytokine or the right cell. And perhaps once that arrives, we will uh, reach there where we can do that. With that, I would like to just bring to the end to this conversation by bringing into the notice of everybody, GINA 2022. Look at step five, where they have been talking about NTIGE, NTIL5, 5R, NTIL4R. In 2022, there is anti-TSLP, which Subin Ahmed has already spoken about. And that now the first line of therapy for type 2 low asthma by GINA is to consider either of the two drugs. And the one drug is NTIL4R uh, receptor antagonist, that is duplimumab, if the patient is oral corticosteroid dependent. If, uh, if the patient is not, then the second choice is to use anti-TSLP therapy, which is the tezipilumab. Uh, so what, what I'm trying to say is that what we conventionally thought that the first choice is bronchial thermoplasty for T2 low is actually now the GINA recommending tezipilumab for that. So maybe there will be more molecules coming up for that space and uh, we will be more effectively able to treat these patients also. 
So this is a space which definitely needs to be seen because every year we are getting and updating into more and more information regarding these patients. But till then, the I think the, the last word would be that uh, we need to phenoendotype them to get into the first choice, the correct choice. And for that, it is not the biomarkers alone which is going to help. It is the overall picture of the patient which is going to make the decision perhaps more uh, accurate and in favor of one biologic over the other. With that, I would like to thank profusely Dr. Doshi, Dr. Arjun and Dr. Subin for this excellent panel discussion on a case of severe asthma. Thank you, Rajesh, for always with me and thank you for your wonderful paper on omalizumab, which has actually opened the eyes of people that it does work, but primary reason for, for, for leaving the therapy or not choosing the therapy is the cost of the therapy. So at the end of the day, cost of therapies need to be brought down very significantly so that it can reach many more patients rather than just a few of them who are really the affording types. With that, I would like to thank everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Deepak, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kumar Doshi, Dr. Arjun, and uh, Dr. Subin. I think we have come to the pack and of the three spectacular days. I think we have the whole, the whole and summarized into three days where most of the clinically uh, there have been a lot of questions for today also, but in the interest of time, I have picked up a few and Dr. Mr. Mayur has uh, shared those interesting questions in the chat box. I think Patabi sir, uh, Dr. Nitin and uh, Devak sir, all the three are there. So we'll just rotate the questions between all the three of you and I think Arjun sir and uh, Dr. Kumar Dr. Subin also can top up. The first question is on uh, pulmonary hypertension. Nitin sir, if you can take that, it's from Dr. Anu Palakat. Role of Tadlafil in ILD, pH rather than oxid. I don't know what she exactly meant. Maybe uh, there's a continuation to the same, 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 from the same person to the same question. In which all ILD pH can be used medical therapy? So probably which all ILDs we can we use medical therapy and role of tadalafil specifically for ILD related pH? Yeah, I think uh, uh, I think the, the I, I'll answer the second question. ILD pH I think it's not far different from uh, you know, pulmonary and arterial hypertension in the sense that if it is a disproportionate. Uh, pH, then it's a different story. But if it is hypoxia, which is driving it, then we have to correct hypoxia as a primary goal. So I think the, the most important answer to, you know, ILD pH is that if the pH is driven by hypoxia and we are not treating hypoxia, then the drugs have almost no role. I, I mean, that's, that's the way. But if it's a disproportionate pulmonary arterial hypertension, for example, a case like sarcoidosis may be having that kind of a disproportionate pulmonary arterial hypertension, then the drugs become relevant. And uh, well, I mean, ambrisentan tadalafil probably is the best combination to be offered for most of the patients who require a drug therapy uh, in the oral format. And that will apply to uh, group one, I mean, I mean, class one, two, three, up to three, and beyond three, you'll have to think of phyloprost and things like that, which are right now not immediately available in this country. In exceptional situations, you can make inhaled phyloprost available, but not routinely. So I think uh, tadalafil in combination with uh, Embry is probably the best combination. Maybe, sir, uh, ILD, sir, as you said, disproportionate pH and even CTD related ILD, systemic closes and all probably this drugs play a much higher role, I suppose. Uh, I, Deepak sir or Patabi sir, anyone wants to add anything on that? So second question, sir, is on uh, IP. I think Patabi sir can take that. Uh, Dr. Manoj Maurya from Delhi has asked, does uh, thermal vapor laboration have any role in asthma COPD overlap? No. Um, so uh, it's, it's for a very specific purpose. What uh, uh, is attempted uh, in a BTVA is to uh, you know take care of the hyperinflated areas which are not uh, functional. So that's typically a smoking COPD. So as of now, all the trials have been only on smoking COPD. So ACO is neither here nor there. There is no BTVA. There is no BT. Well, going by. <laughs> 
Deepak, I think it uh, looks like BT is for nobody, but you know, I can fight validly. Uh, as far as this question goes, no, uh, the BTVA, no role in the um, in AFC board. Okay, thank you so much, sir. And uh, I just come back to Deepak, sir. So this is a query from uh, Dr. Santosh Das in Kolkata. Uh, in severe asthma, the role of high dose inhaled steroids is well established, but will giving high dose LABA help in severe asthma? So I think my answer would be to that, that uh, high dose LABA means that you are using uh, beyond certain limit, which is like uh, very high limits, which... Uh, generally would be more toxic to the patient. So I can only go to a certain level, but uh, high dose, in, in fact, you increase the ICS dose in asthma, it does make sense. But um, increasing just the bronchodilator won't. So I would rather use a lama to along with a lava rather than just increasing the dose of lava there. And if the patient still does not work, it's the corticosteroids which are going to work in asthma. So not much of a great help to just keep on increasing the dose of LABA actually. Although in some patients, they do use it and uh, they do find that there is some response to it. But that's an individual response. Cannot be uh, ca categorized for all kind of severe asthma patients. Okay, sir. Point, point very well communicated. Uh, back in uh, question from uh, Dr. From Ahmad. He has asked the role of prostacyclin analogs in prophylaxis of pH. I don't know what exactly he meant, but prostacyclin analogs in prophylaxis. That's what he has asked. I, I think it almost sounds like science fiction, isn't it? I mean, we, we don't have them and uh, <laughs> we are trying to use them in prophylaxis. So, well, I mean, I, 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 I would leave it at that. You know, we are dealing with orals right now. So, let's be realistic that let's not discuss something which is beyond the realms. I mean, in a lyloprost is just around the corner. So, maybe we can discuss in a lyloprost. But I think uh, we, we, we really don't have, except in clinical trials, except for in clinical trials, we don't have them. So, I think at this point in time, uh, let's stick to what we have, Ambrisintan, Macetintan, Tadalafil, Sildenafil, and, uh, um, and Riasuguat. So I think these are the few options which are available to us. And in a Lyloprost on compassionate basis, that is what has been discussed. So I think let's stick to what we have. And uh, I mean, let's leave the future for the future. I mean, when, if, when it comes, it will cross that ball. Uh, the fence. Perfect, sir. Perfect, sir. I think I don't know what he meant also with that question. Yeah. So I think there is one more question on IP to Patabi, sir. Uh, Doctor Mahindra Kar from Nanded. He has asked uh, again regarding uh, thermal wave collaboration for emphysema. Here we do each setting single segment or multiple segment. That's his first query. And again, after how many months of the procedure does HRCT become normal? So um, it's not the segment, it's the sub-segment. And that's what the uh, trials have uh, shown. Initially, they were uh, going for lobes and then segments. And so now they found out that if you go miniature and then concentrate on segments and sub-segments, which are uh, more diseased, you could actually have both the safety and efficacy ensured. In which case, you can always repeat it. And the typical repeat will be after three months. How long does the CT take to become normal. It doesn't become normal, but there will be a scar that happens. I think Nagas in one of his slides have shown that. It, it usually typically takes at least a month for the whole uh, process to uh, get into some atelectasis. The idea is you burn those areas uh, or you steam those areas, cook those areas so that it becomes fibrous and then those areas, uh, you know, shrivels and uh, occupies lesser space and so you get a much better contour of, uh, of the lung on the whole. So the idea is to concentrate on uh, heterogeneous uh, areas. The uh, very, very significantly involved areas will be dealt with first. And follow uh, uh, settings will be decided based on how the improvement goes. The patient uh, looks fine, does fine, just forget about it. And obviously, you're, you're looking at uh, not at any specific uh, numbers here, uh, it, it, it's on how the patient feels and it feels better. And if the RVP TLC comes down, the patient's uh, hyperinflation is uh, taken care of. You can wait as long as the patient, uh, you know, is fine. And if he complains again, that is the time that you do it. There is no 
uh, hard uh, fast rules uh, as far as when the second sitting goes and so on. Okay, sir, thank you. Uh, again, the remaining major questions are from then take opinions from uh, Dr. Arjun and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Suresh from Chennai has asked, do vaccines have any role in managing asthma? If yes, which vaccine, how? Probably yes, is the role of pneumococcal and influenza vaccine in asthmatics, probably. I don't know, the direct lot of vaccines. <laughs> Deepak sir, your call on that. So see, uh, viral exacerbations are known to cause worsening of asthma control and producing exacerbations and hospitalizations in asthmatics also. So if you are using a viral vaccines, they are going to reduce it. So influenza vaccine has been shown to reduce exacerbations and hospitalizations. Previously, they were thought to actually worsen the uh, asthma control, but now it is known that they decreases the viral induced exacerbations. So though there are group, uh, the exacerbations can be both allergen induced as well as viral or pollutant induced. So viral induced exacerbations will be reduced. That's additional point, which will get no extra cost. So vaccinations against viruses, whatever is available. Right now you have influenza and COVID, but tomorrow you will have RSV also. Maybe we'll have more vaccines to come. So they will be definitely a part in the management of asthma. Arjun sir, you want to add anything on that? Nothing more. And Dr. Deepak has very clearly summarized that. Subin? Sir, same opinion, sir. Sir has summarized very perfectly. A couple of questions more remaining from Asma. Uh, Dr. Mehul Patel from Ahmedabad is asking us, at which point in asthma should we do an allergic test, skin prick test in asthma management? This is a tough one. Somebody wants to focus on immunotherapy, when to do skin prick test and give them immunotherapy. Like Pattabi actually poked me on bronchial thermoplasty. So somebody is poking me on immunotherapy also. My question is, you know, when we are talking about severe asthma, severe asthma patients are not for immunotherapy. See, immunotherapy patients have to have mild to borderline moderate asthma. Their FEV1 must be more than 50%. They must be stable patients where you can use it. Uncontrolled patients are not candidates for immunotherapy at all. Above all, immunotherapy is only approved for a house dust mite. And that is sublingual, which has been approved. And it has been shown to be more effective in controlling allergic rhinitis rather than truly asthma. And improvement in allergic rhinitis, no doubt, will definitely improve the asthma control. So yes, indirectly, it would help, but only different subgroup of patients, not severe asthma patients. And then you need to identify your IgE-mediated asthma. So patients should have a symptomatology to give some indication that some allergens in, or aeroallergens are having role to play in producing exacerbations or worsening of asthma control in these patients. If that is there, go ahead and do it. But remember that you need to have good lung functions. You should not be on the contraindication side to do the skin prick test. You can always do specific IgE in the blood, but then you can use avoidance there, not necessarily immunotherapy. Avoidance is equally important part in management of asthma patients where asthma control is just being lost because of repeated exposure to something which you are allergic to. Sir, again, uh, sir, again, avoidance, like uh, as sir said, uh, uh, leaving the therapeutic part apart, I would do an allergy test uh, in an atopic individual who is having even mild persistent asthma or mild intermittent asthma because the basic thing is trigger avoidance. You can identify the triggers. It's not very expensive test. And you can simply ask the patient to uh, avoid those uh, high value uh, allergy, allergy test positive things. So you can do it. Not a problem, I guess. As Sal said, it should not be on the contraindicated side. That's all. Ajit sir, anything to add? No, okay. Maybe, sir, one thing that I can think of is if you want to start tomorrow, you can doubly prove the allergic nature of the disease with the skin prick test. That's the only, only thing that I think of when it comes to severe asthma. Uh, maybe we'll come to the last question. I think this is probably the most crunchy question. I think I'll start off with Deepak sir and I will get opinion from Dr. Arjun and Dr. Subin also. 
when it comes to anti interleukin 5 therapy which one is superior and in what way this question should go to actually patta viraman <laughs> <laughs> okay, sir. Patam, sir. Okay. I put my foot <laughs> no, no. that wrong hole, so this time I'm leaving it to Patavi. <laughs> no, no, no. no there, there are no head to head trials, so I mean, I wouldn't really. If I get curious, uh, apart from this, Kavanagh's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, one person, one author's uh, uh, three uh, publications uh, saying that, you know, uh, you know, Benralismab after Napolismab work. The, the, I mean, I wouldn't really bother too much about it. I would say that, okay, there are uh, uh, no significant differences uh, between the two, uh, excepting in terms of certain cases, Nepalismap, maybe 100 might not be enough. It's not that it's not acting, maybe 100 might not be enough. If you, if you listen to Dr. Paranesh Nair, he would uh, clearly tell you why certain cases Nepalismap did not act and hence Nepalismap was used, was because 100 milligrams was not enough. But I wouldn't really... Uh, see a difference between these two and I would uh, stop there because I am not an expert in that and uh, back to Deepak. I think it's right back to Deepak because he's the most, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> accomplished guy to really answer all these uh, questions. Deepak. But that way it's a real hard choice because I think at the end of the day, we all need to understand that when the when a older drug is being compared with a newer drug, we need to remember that there has been refinements in phenoendotyping which has arrived. So that is why the results of that particular drug may look to be a little better than whatever was the precedented drug, but it does not happen. Most of them are equally effective. However, there is some subgroup analysis of both the drugs which have shown that they work better in particular group of patients. And that is like those patients who have got uh, uh, like uh, hyper eosinophilic syndrome, eGPA, where mepolizumab does score over uh, penralizumab. On the other hand, there is a data which again shows that the patients who have got more of echo-like characteristics, like smoking asthmatics, then the benralizumab does better job in those patients. So similarly, there are also a group of patients who have uh, obesity as well as patients with bronchiectasis, where again the benralizumab has shown to be better. On the other hand, the patients with nasal polyposis have been shown to be good with mepolizumab as well as benralizumab as well as duplimumab. So all it is very confusing there, but then most of the times you are basically depending yourself on the subgroup analysis to show that which one did better with which particular drug with no head-to-head -head trials at all. Very difficult decisions, but I think at the end of the day, it is a physician who after using it starts realizing that in this particular patient, this would look better because perhaps I, I think that those characteristics uh, which I'm looking for, for drug A or drug B are more present in our individual patients. So I think if I look like that, I generally take the decisions on that part. Here, I think we can take the opinions from Arjun sir as well as Dr. Subin. Uh, I do agree with Dr. Uh, the, what uh, Dr. Deepak uh, Tarwara has said, but um, I'd like to add a couple of more points. Number one is uh, there are no head-to-head -head trials. Um, that is one thing. But when you look from a theoretical point of view, uh, that eosinophil depletion by Pendrali may hold a slight edge over mepolizumab. That is one thing. And secondly, the once in two months dosing of Pendrali may have a slight edge over mepoli. But having said that, when you look into all the other things that uh, one you expect uh, when you treat a patient with severe asthma, like exacerbation reduction, decrease in oral steroid use, there is nothing uh, much to choose between these two drugs. So, I think you are a fan of Sir. Uh, sir, yeah, I would uh, like to, I, I beg to differ because uh, with, without any bias, just it's based on my limited experience on benralizumab and mepolizumab. I would uh, prefer benralizumab with no offense to mepolizumab or uh, their parent company, just because of a few reasons. In the sense, <clears throat> mepoli, we have Dream, we have uh, 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 Mensa <clears throat> and all those trials, whereas benrali we have a bunch of huge trials in the sense right from uh, Kelima, Sirocco, Zonda, Andi, Bonente, Meltemi. So all these trials, we have got a huge bunch of uh, subjects. And the most important thing, they have, they have uh, added up from first trial number one to trial number two, same patients, trial number three. And when you look at the long-term benefits on FEV1 and uh, symptom control and OCS reduction, uh, I would say Benrali has a slight edge over mepolizumab. That is one thing. 
as surgeon sir very well said the bi bi monthly dosing the patient will be very keen about that bi monthly dosing and the third thing which i am a huge fan i checked the eosinophil of my patient after 48 48 hours it was 1040 and after 48 hours hours, hours it was zero the eosinophil count so the rapid eosinophil depletion in the peripheral blood and later in the airway that i think in my personal opinion uh, will uh, add on to the symptom relief and uh, better uh, exacerbation reduction and ocs reduction and uh, again the truff fev1 at 52 weeks uh, the bendrali uh, the bendrali arm it's not uh, going down whereas the mepoli arm if it's going the it's going down correct me if i am wrong so based on these a couple of small points i am a fan of bendrali compared to mepoli but again egpa chronic rhinosinusitis again only uh, indicated and approved is mepolizumab that's all perfect perfect has been perfectly summarized and uh, subin so is such a big fan of bendalismab that a couple of his relatives are also lined up for bendalismab the next couple of months <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, we have sorted out most of the relevant questions so if uh, anyone and uh, wants to add something we can have that otherwise we probably call it a day david sir prithin sir whatever sir uh, i think we are good good to go yes uh, yeah. so we had three brilliant days sir and today also we had three brilliant seminars i don't know the attendance today but i have been told that the delegate number on the last two days was above 4000 in pan india so that really goes to ensure the the quality of program the the aptness of the topic and the quality of uh, faculty and very good work that uh, mankind has done to disseminate this information uh, is anyone from mankind around or or shall we just close it today with with the doctor? just close the day dr rajesh you have to close the day yes okay okay um, so i express my sincere gratitude to the ics office for uh, dr swarnakar uh, dr uh, rajadhar and then the napcon uh, organizers dr samriya dr kumar also and all the faculty all the all the session moderators all the facilitators all the panelists this has been a very scintillating show and i hope uh, we will be able to replicate it in subsequent years and i sincerely thank mankind Man aspirants for holding this uh, show facilitating it and allowing us to be a part of that i would request all panelists as well as uh, moderators to just give the suggestions to mankind team so that they can come up with uh, better ideas if anything for the subsequent sessions so with that uh, if i may be permitted to uh, close today's session and i thank everyone deepak sir patabi sir nidin sir nidin sir has been instrumental in devising this program arjun sir subin everyone good night thank you good night good night Bye-bye.